welcome everyone. Thank you for taking time to join the webinar on Crafting Roots, Learn and Connect. Uh, firstly, I want to especially thank uh, IIE, Indian Institute of Entrepreneurship, British Council, Finer, and Facebook for this joint collaboration in organizing the special webinar for the you know entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs, and artisans in the northeast from the northeast of India. The fundamentals of organizing jointly organizing the, this webinar is to enhance the idea of revolutionizing and re-engineering craft industry in northeast of India, making it a viable business venture, ensuring compliance across matrix, dedicated uh, to meet the global standards of market terms, ownership in decision-making by women, economic growth, and cultural sensitivity. Most importantly, we've organized this webinar to meet the new challenges and impact made to livelihood due to COVID-19 pandemic. This is a prudent and a very strategic partnership leveraging vast experience and reach of Indian Institute of Entrepreneurship as an institute and an incubation for entrepreneurs with British Council's mandate to support arts and crafts as an enabler internationally, while Facebook bringing the largest social media platform on building market linkages, which is the core of Impulse Social Enterprise. So before we move ahead, I would like to introduce a little bit about my organization, Impulse NGO Network and Impulse Social Enterprise. Impulse NGO Network is an organization working to eliminate human trafficking and unsafe migration of women and children in the Northeast of India, South and Southeast Asia. Uh, to, to, in order to eliminate human trafficking, it was imperative to eliminate the socioeconomic problems, the breed which was the breath of the evil, which brings us to the sources of sustainable livelihood. And this was the purpose of how Impulse Social Enterprise was born. It is the heart of a collaborative ecosystem that provides livelihood and dignity for all, especially women and children among tribes in Northeast India and other countries of South and Southeast Asia. So before I move ahead, uh, much more larger ambit of how the webinar is going to look. I would like to introduce, uh, welcome Dr. Abhijit Sharma, who is the director of Indian Institute of Entrepreneurship to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Amarin. And uh, welcome everyone uh, for being part of this excellent, uh, uh, wonderful webinar, uh, which is crafting roots to address women empowerment and leadership. Uh, as you know, in any crisis, women face the major brunt. And uh, they are also the most resilient of the two genders. And uh, we believe crafts could be the way forward. And also, collaboration is the new mantra for the new normal that is coming in. And I, I would like to thank the entire first impulse for bringing a galaxy of people, particularly British Council and all the eminent panelists today. I uh, would also like to thank Finer, uh, who have been collaborating with us on this initiative of NERES, which I will speak a little later. And, uh, and of course, Impulse, who, Ashina especially, who has been instrumental to do this tie up, if I may call it, with uh, also Facebook. Uh, a little about Indian use of entrepreneurship, just uh, uh, half a second. Uh, it's an institute at the national level uh, under the Ministry of Skills and Entrepreneurship has been set up in 1994. So we have been 25 years in experience in entrepreneurship in various aspects of uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, we have been working primarily mostly in the rural uh, micro entrepreneurs. But then uh, uh, last year or for the last uh, two years, we have been looking at a new group of entrepreneurs who have uh, come to the space, which is the startup guys. Guys with a whole lot of beautiful ideas, but doesn't have the capacity to commercialize it, particularly in the Northeast. And that's how the concept of NERES came in, Northeast Regional Startup and Entrepreneurship Summit, where Fina, Rajiv Agarwal and Rajiv Goswami, two Rajivs are here, uh, uh, they were they part of this collaboration and of course NEC who they decided to sponsor this entire program. 
the idea of this program or the platform is to provide a platform for these new ideas which have the potential to scale up substantially a lot of these ideas are actually solving problems around rural crafts handloom etc a lot of these guys are also today in our in our midst and i'm sure they will really benefit from the immense experience the panelists including british council will bring today uh, for me personally it will be i'm sure a learning experience and uh, we look forward to a wonderful one hour of deliberation so again thanks impulse for making this happen and hope uh, we have a beautiful one hour deliberation thank you very much over to um, you emery thank you so much dr abhiji sharma so uh, the webinar is for two hours i'm sorry everyone but it's going to be amazing and i promise all of you you're not going to uh, regret it uh, so this webinar is being recorded and it's also being shared live on neris facebook page british council page and impulse uh, social enterprises um so this webinar is broadly divided into two panel discussion one one hour each the first panel will focus on creating livelihood while meeting the challenges of covid-19 pandemic and then we have the second panel discussion of another one hour which will focus on accelerating the use of digital platform for finance and marketability so without further ado i'm going to introduce our moderator of this event jonathan kennedy he is the director of arts british council he is responsible for developing national strategy managing stakeholder relationships across government and the creative industries and conceptualizing programs to promote and strengthen india uk cultural relations through collaborations connections and creative partnerships british council major multi year arts and culture programs in india currently include festivals for the future and crafting futures Jonathan has substantial experience in theater producing, arts management and international cultural exchange. From to, from the year 2007 to 2019, he was the executive director of Tara Arts, contributing especially to the major 2.8 million GBP capital redevelopment of Tara Theater and the launch of the Black Theater Life National Touring Consortium. before tara arts he was arts program manager of croydon clock tower and head of studio and program development at wimbledon wimbledon theatre in the uk he was a regular guest lecturer in all aspects of theatre producing leadership and arts management at birkbeck college south bank university goldsmiths kings college london and st mary's university of minnesota so jonathan welcome and over to you thank you very much amarin and dr sharma uh, and a big warm welcome from delhi across india and northeast india in particular where many of our speakers who work in the craft sector are currently in lockdown as of course are we all uh, we are delighted to have been working with impulse mgo originally we were planning for this event to happen in guwahati in march and then covid-19 struck and so we've moved the venture onto a different kind of platform to ensure we retain the important dialogue around women's empowerment in the craft sector and we're particularly pleased to be working with impulse mgo given the amount of work and the substantial amount of change that comes from uh, impulse by working with women and their families who've been the victims of trafficking British Council's uh, global program Crafting Futures as Emerine said is around supporting livelihoods of crafts people worldwide and in India and in particular in our work in this country it's regarding empowerment of women who form the heart soul and the backbone of the craft economy yet perhaps are often unsung and undervalued the British Council places women's empowerment for creative expression international exchange and skills for enterprise at the crux of our crafts program in india we recently launched a piece of research with fashion revolution focused on gender equity and the women women workforce in cotton farming in india that piece of research um described 
that 60% of the textile industry is in cotton and women's role in far as farmers in cotton is often unacknowledged. The, UN, the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization estimates that if women had the same access to resources as men in farming, productivity would improve by 20 to 30 percent. This affirms that women's access to resources and opportunity leads to improved livelihoods for everyone. The emergency of COVID-19 poses huge challenges for the long-term resilience and sustainability of livelihoods of artisans and threatens the disparate craft economy now. So perhaps at this time, at this point, with great uncertainty, women's empowerment should be prioritized as the center of the craft economy with their skill and enterprise to develop, to become the engine for change, to survive beyond COVID-19. Our Partners Impulse NGO have lined up a stellar lineup, which forms a tapestry of speakers across the craft, design, and enterprise digital economy. And with all that said, we'll move to our speakers very soon. Just to reiterate some of the, uh, the rules of engagement, please ensure, unless you're speaking, that you remain on mute. Do use the chat box function for asking any questions of the speakers, and we'll be using those to then form part of the Q&A after each of the speakers has spoken. Um, and we're on Facebook Live, as has been said, and we will be working in the, also in terms of we have colleagues with Impulse NGO in Australia and the UK, who'll also be drawing together a, a report following these two hours, so all of your inputs and questions will be hugely valuable. So now, with that said, to the matter in hand, crafting roots, learn, connect, helping women artisans and entrepreneurs explore business and marketability post COVID-19. Our first hour is centered on livelihoods. And with that, we'll move to our first speaker, who is Radhi Parikh, founder of Artisans in Mumbai, who've been doing stellar work in Nagaland, in particular, with the crafts community there. But Artisans in Mumbai has a whole plethora of work going on that supports artisans from across the country and their work in design and craft. Uh, Radhi will be speaking on uh, 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 livelihoods, living heritage, and sustainability. So over to you, Radhi. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for that very generous introduction and a very good afternoon to Emerine and my fellow panelists, whom we have so much to learn from. Um, so Jonathan, in, in addition to what you said about artisans, one of the things that the, our work in the Northeast has been centered on is through a foundation that we created just a few years ago called the Artisans for Sustainable Development Foundation. And uh, this is our very first project. It's still very much in its infancy. Um, but it really does help us to go one step forward in our partnerships with artisans as empowered owners of the creative process who, you know, currently even in our bricks and mortar place earn a majority of the proceeds. So ASDF uh, was really a step in the direction of being able to understand design for development. And in a sense, when we represented so many NGOs and designers who were doing great work in the field, it was an opportunity for us to uh, walk the talk, if you like. Um, so in particular, we're interested in exploring a value-based economic model where design is co-creative, where the products for new markets are created with complete participation with the artisans, in this case, a whole community of women weavers and who own the process and where cultural and intellectual property, particularly in a sensitive area like the Northeast, um, where local identity is so very special and unique, that's very much at the center of the ethos. And of course, um, 
you know, bringing them to market through branding, design, all of the things that we uh, have been doing all these years. So with that, I um, would like to share uh, a PowerPoint, Namrata, if you wouldn't mind sharing your screen. And while that's coming on, um, just very briefly, um, I've called the PowerPoint Nettle, the fabric of the future. It's a wild fiber that's foraged in the wild um, and tamed really by the women of this little village where we work. Um, we encountered Leshami. Um, Namrata, any luck? Yeah, yeah. yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, okay. yes, All right, great. So, um, we encountered, oops, I have, um, I've lost my screen. How do I go back to my screen? Namrata, could I go back to my screen maybe? Just one second. Maybe I can share the screen. Ma'am, just uh, click the escape button. It should be fine. Oh, okay. All right. Namrata, do you want me to share the screen or maybe I Ma'am, I'll share it from my end. Okay, and then I click escape. Yeah. I'm so sorry about the technical. No, it's okay. <laughs> so I traveled to the Northeast while we're working all this out. Um, for the first time in 2016 with two senior journalists and um, we were invited to this village that is um, close to one of the highest and coldest places in Nagaland. Namrata, are you able to share the screen? Ma'am, it's... Yes, ma'am, it's coming. Yeah? Everyone's able to see it? Yeah, we can all see it, yes. Oh, great. All yes, ma'am, we can see it. So um, we were greeted by this amazing demonstration by a group of 50 women of how uh, stinging nettle was foraged, was stripped uh, from the stem. It's a vast fiber and tamed really and made soft enough to be worn. And I was incredibly moved by this experience of coming to you know, some, a, a remote, inaccessible nearly place and seeing this amazing transformation of um, a very resourceful community who were using the materials that they had at hand in a process that was rather labor intensive, but which had unchanged for centuries. And together with that, those of you who know the Peck district in Nagaland will also know that they sing in beautiful harmony. So they were also singing their weaving song. So one of the women at the end of this approached us, uh, the one who'd organized the visit and asked if we could do something together. She really what she now lived in a city and wanted to give back. And she's currently the managing and coordinating um, point of contact for this project. And we embraced it. I mean, I was just so moved by the whole experience. And uh, the reason why I think it, it was a particularly important time in the Northeast is that, you know, my travels since have taken me along this uh, four lane highway that's being constructed, which will link the Northeast, particularly Nagaland through Southeast Asia to China. And everyone is very aware that there will be huge changes in this last frontier, both good and bad. And, um, you know, the choices that they make in terms of the direction of the development that they bring here. Next slide. So what I learned, um, Namrata, we're on slide three. Slide yes, three. Yeah. 
So what I learned was that the entire way of life is naturally self-sustainable. Um, here you see a communal land which is used for grazing as well as for uh, slide three. Um, and the tree, as you can see, is, um, you know, just locked off in, in the top for firewood so that the tree can regenerate. Um, so, you know, various things like this that were about respecting the natural life cycle, about recycling and regeneration as a way of life. And when my two journalist colleagues talked to the women, they said, they were completely self-sufficient in this village, that really they didn't need anything from the outside world except the salt and now sugar because the young people like sugar um, and sweet things. So each home I noticed had a kitchen garden with a real diversity that was, um, you know, from fruit trees, it was plum season at that time, going on to wild apple season, to uh, medicinal herbs. And as we walked through the village, the women would say, this is really good for diabetes and this is really good for blood pressure. And they were, they were really living very, very close to the land. And yesterday I spoke to one of our key uh, people in the village and I asked them how things had been. And he very proudly said that Nagaland is in the green zone that they had the lockdown only for a few days, at least in their village. And I don't believe that this can only be attributed to the fact that Nagaland is remote. I think that, you know, the unique diet and the lifestyle that I saw um, makes for very high immunity amongst the people. And I personally was really surprised that there wasn't a doctor nearby because they rarely needed a doctor. So with that, the next slide, please, uh, Namrata. Yes, ma'am. Slide four. So as you'll see, I just wanted to show you the interior of a typical Naga home in the village. As you can see, everything from rice husks to the stalk, everything is recycled into these beautiful, beautiful uh, products that are the epitome of form follows function for a designer like me. Um, the next slide. All the women are weavers. And Namrita, if you could share the next slide, you'll see one of the proud women. Um, and unlike other parts of India where weaving is very much regarded as manual labor, here, um, it's a matter of pride for the women. Uh, each home or each woman in each home has their own backstrap loom. And uh, you can see on this slide what an amazing intricacy of extra weft weaving, embroidery, tufting, and all of that um, they uh, traditionally uh, incorporate into the weaving of the garments. Last night, I learned that, you know, they were all involved with their pre-monsoon rice planting and uh, weaving as a sole occupation can only be done for four months from November to February, which is exclusive time for something like that. So what I learned was that they were actually thinking of allowing young weavers to um, give full time to their weaving practices. And I thought that that was a really significant change that uh, women didn't need to abandon their looms um, to go in for agriculture, but it's a very fragile relationship between what we call the primary occupation uh, of agriculture and then uh, the same people being involved with, um, with weaving. Um, this slide shows an elder of the Chakasang tribe, who are the main tribe of the Peck district, uh, wearing a shawl that uh, he's really earned the right to wear. So a lot of these uh, pieces of clothing tell you much about the wearer, about their status in the community, 
And typically they would have done something to earn the status uh, through feasts of merit and all sorts of uh, ways of giving back to the community. Next, so back to nettle. Nettle in the, in the local language is called thedbo. Um, it grows wild, as I said, and it's harvested once a year. Um, so you can imagine that they go deep into the forest to uh, harvest the really tall nettle. And like linen, linen and hemp, it's a bast fiber. It's the long stem of the, uh, of the nettle that is stripped and converted into fiber. Um, there, you know, if we can generate further demand by making the market more conscious of this amazing zero footprint, completely sustainable fab, fab fiber of the future, um, the village can be persuaded to increase their production. But currently, it's like gold dust in the village. Uh, the next slide. So how does it become this amazing material, the nettle and cotton cloth that you see on the slide? Um, and Namrata, I'm just going to ask you to maybe go through the next few slides to share the process of the making of such a cloth. So this is what it looks like when it's dried. Um, and then the lady is thigh reeling the fibers to join the fibers to create yarn. Next. Uh, winding the yarn. And then something that's really quite dramatic when you watch it, the spinning with the drop spindle. And you can see that each of these women are wearing the nettle shawl around their shoulders. Um, the scarring and the starching with the coarse rice. Next slide. So a very sweet story related to this is that, you know, every bit of rice flour that falls on the ground is then collected and made into little rice cakes for the children of the village. Next. Preparing the weft. Next. And then the warp, which is an alternation of cotton and nettle. Next. dyeing the cotton. So it's very interesting. The cotton is dyed in a local, they said it was rice uh, soil from the rice fields, but it's obviously a, an iron rich soil because it yields a lovely rich black color that's uh, used as their main identity. Um, and then next you'll see the loin loom weaver, the young weaver who's also a real innovator in terms of design. Uh, she's taken on a lot of the design responsibilities for the new work that we're doing. Um, so next, um, you're all wondering, so what is artisan's role? So we um, really align ourselves with the UN's 2030 vision of providing dignified livelihoods, particularly to women and to empower women artisans to transform their lives through honoring their, not only the timeless craft traditions, but their livelihoods. Um, we've, we've, we're trying to sustain the livelihoods through market-led co-creative design and to develop local entrepreneurship and production systems. Uh, next slide. And in particular, one of the things that we do, I think, well, is to brand, promote, and market, and enable feedback from the, uh, from, uh, the market as to the response of, to the products. But the most important thing I feel, particularly at this time in the COVID uh, world, is that you know, we need to raise consumer consciousness for a very simple and humble uh, fiber like this and to really begin to value the humanity of handmade. 
uh, next. So as I said, this, um, this cloth is locally known by a name that roughly translates to thick, rough cloth, but it has a unique identity, something that I was uh, really thunderstruck by. It has this wonderfully restrained minimal black line that runs through the middle of each strip. Each strip is then joined together through embroidery into a shawl. And uh, today it's regarded very much, a new shawl like this would be regarded as a luxury because it's a time consuming effort and it's dearly valued for sale on, on open markets. But um, as you saw the women wearing it on their shoulder, it's also sort of used as a carry-all in the field. And next slide. So this is just to give you a glimpse of the process. We sat around uh, in, a, in a circle, huddled together on a cold winter morning to talk about this line as a design element. And I have to say that as I kept talking about this identity to the women, they looked terribly puzzled and I couldn't understand why until I realized and the lady translated and said that um, identity is not a, a very welcome word because they only understand it as their identity cards, the dreaded identity cards. So it was quite funny, but uh, you know, for this meeting, we got over that hurdle and we began to experiment together for the first time with widths like runners and mats that they could do on the loin loom. And much of the design that you now, that you see, next slide, has come in from them with this little bit of an input from us. The next slide. So the, for the first time in the next slide, you'll see that we've also dyed the cotton with the natural black dye. Um, they're they're uh, experimenting with the rhythm and the balance and the symmetry and the asymmetry of the line. And on the next one, you see the product. Uh, that we made with, you know, narrow widths. Um, and the next slide, you will see the entire suite of table linen, or should I say table nettle. Um, and then just a little glimpse into a project on the next slide that we did in early 2018 was that we, um, put together a fashion show for the Indian Merchants Chamber in Mumbai. And we paired eight artisans with eight women designers, women artisans with women designers. And we invited Pella from Bangalore, um, to, who creates these wonderful zero waste garments to partner with the weavers. So she was there in the photograph that you saw. And she created a line of garments for this fashion show where the weaver, who, the young woman on the right and Pella together took the bow on the fashion ramp. And these garments are zero footprint, zero waste, completely 100% sustainable from start to finish. Um, and with that, I just want to end with... Um, the brand, uh, Leshami Origins, named after the place where um, nettle uh, really originated according to their legend, nettle cloth, and it predates cotton. Also, I should have added that locally, uh, tree cotton was grown and it was a naturally brown and red color. Also, they originally had indigo dyeing and madder dyeing. So we're trying to go back to that. But in terms of the main question for the seminar today, um, what are our challenges? So the biggest challenge is that, um, you know, with God's grace, uh, everyone in the village is well. They've been able to continue their work. But during this time, communication was certainly um, a huge challenge, you know. Um, had we had a way to communicate directly or even through um, our wonderful uh, leader and coordinator, we would have been able to see how to spontaneously um, um, 
spontaneously improvised designs based on the, the supply of material that they had. Um, the women are really proud of the income that has been generated through, through the project, but we need to bring in training in design, in entrepreneurship, in costing, in market awareness, all those good things that create a good economic ecosystem. Um, as I said, we will probably be looking at full-time weavers for consistent production. The cost of materials is still very high because we don't have the economy of scale. Um, there are many barriers, firstly, travel to a rather inaccessible part of India, um, but also the language barrier. Um, but I hope that uh, in, in time, and in, I hope in a very short time, there is market awareness and appreciation for this very humble nettle, which uh, is, is a weed, but today it's a vitally relevant fiber for the future. And uh, you can get in touch with us uh, with all of the coordinates on this slide. But thank you so much, Jonathan, for the opportunity to represent Leshmi Origins today. Thank you very much, Radhi. That was absolutely beautiful. Uh, uh, photograph, senses of the, the heritage, the design, the sense of sustainability that comes from some, such a, and on the face of it, base material that can then be transformed into something totally astonishing. Um, I think in fact there are many many comments and actually calls to connect with you on the chat box. So rather than um, address them directly, I think if you go onto the chat box yourself in a moment you'll be able to see calls to arms and calls to connect across the country. And thank you for that you addressed the question, in fact that had come through from our colleague at the British Council in Wales. So um, thank you Bethan for that and connecting. It shows we're not just in England, but in India, we're also across many countries over the course of this webinar. And we'll move now to our next uh, speaker, which is Sharda Gautam, who's the Head of Crafts at the Tata Trusts, and has been instrumental in the design, delivery and development of a very significant project called Antaran, which is currently also supporting artisans to reach new markets by direct sales which go direct to the artisan's um, account without the intervention of um, middle agencies um, and with that i'll introduce sharda and move and he's going to be speaking about livelihoods no he isn't sorry that was that was um radi apologies designing craft-based livelihood programs over to you sharda thank you jonathan good afternoon everyone I'll straight, in the interest of time, I'll straightway move to the presentation which I have prepared for the today's talk. Uh, just give me a second. Are you able to see the screen? Jonathan, are you able to see the screen? Uh, no, uh, no Gautam, we can't see the screen. Mm. We, we can now, thank you. Screen not visible. Ah. Gone now again. Uh, can I quickly email you? Uh,
I've sent it on the WhatsApp group. Can someone open, uh, maybe share the screen? Perhaps you could walk us through the introduction until the screen pops up, Shanta, and then and then hopefully yeah, sure. I will, I will I'll catch that. up with you. I'm just mindful of our time. Sure. Okay, thanks very much. Sure. Um, uh, task based library inventions, uh, we have uh, conceptualized in the form of Pantaran. I have uh, taken that as a backdrop to share what, uh, um, how we have done it in case of Pantaran. Maybe others can benefit from that. Um, essentially, uh, what we have tried to look at when we were conceptualizing Antaran um, was to study and understand what are the core problems which are plaguing the sector at the moment. Uh, we had gone through a couple of reports, uh, research reports, which were taken up between 2010 and 2017 uh, and found out that there were common parameters which were mentioned as, as the key problems in the sector. These included outdated technology, design, marketing, drift of artisans from the sector and so on and so forth. We went back to 1940s and uh, tried to look at reports which are available to understand what were the problems back then when India became free. And we found out that the problem, the nature of the problems which was mentioned in 1947 Industries Conference was also very similar to what we found in 2010 to 2017 uh, decade. Uh, there also they mentioned that issues are related to technology, issues are related to design, issues are related to marketing. Uh, essentially, that reflected that whatever efforts uh, we as a as a community, both government and civil society, have undertaken, perhaps they haven't led to the result what we were trying to uh, look at. So uh, we went further and tried to understand: Are these the real core problems, or are these only symptoms of the problem? The way when you have fever, you have high temperature. So high temperature is not the source of the problem. High temperature is only a symptom. So similarly, issues in design, issues in marketing, issues in uh, artisans moving the out of the sector uh, were the symptoms and not the core problem. Um, after that, I think I would need this slide because there's a graph there which would be interesting for everyone to observe. Uh, uh, did you receive the uh, slide, Jonathan? Or someone in the team shared it on WhatsApp so that it is delivered yes, quickly. So, uh, it's on its way. I'm, I'm just downloading it. Okay, sure, sure, sure. So, just wait for five, ten seconds and then maybe so that's an interesting graph which I wanted to show. So, while we were trying to understand the uh, nature of the problem, uh, the root cause of the problems instead of the symptoms, we traveled to many weaving clusters across the country to see what has been the scenario. We visited Varanasi, we visited a couple of clusters in Bihar, in Uttar Pradesh, in Northeast, uh, in South. And uh, surprisingly, what happened was when you look at, when you spoke to artisans who had left weaving, let's say, a year back, and uh, those who were weaving three years or five years back, in general, you will find that uh, those who have left weaving now, three years or four years back, they were weaving artificial fibers. If you go back further, another three, four years beyond that, so that's about seven, eight years from the time when we had the discussion, they were weaving in low grade uh, fibers and using the cheaper dyes. And few years before that, they had uh, started uh, copying the products which power loom industry was proposing uh, and putting up in the market. So essentially what was emanating from there was that people assume that there is a competition from power loom industry and therefore to make sure that they survive in the market, they have to produce stuff which is very similar to what power loom produces. Now in this game of uh, matching up with the power loom, they try to start weaving at a much faster phase. So productivity and efficiency became the key criteria instead of creativity. And therefore, what happened gradually, uh, of course, if you weave at a much faster pace, your quality uh, would suffer. So they started receiving rejections. In order to make sure that they were able to uh, compete in the market, they started using the low-grade fibers, which costed less. And therefore, they assumed that the price of the final product can be lowered down further. Further discussions revealed that in order to reduce the prices further, they started using uh, uh, chemical dyes and moved on to even synthetic fibers. So in the most famous clusters like Varanasi also, you will find that out of uh, nine broader uh, sub-clusters within Varanasi, six of them are moving, move, have moved into polyester and, and, and artificial zari. In case of Nagaland, about which Radhi spoke so passionately, uh, Nagaland, the majority of the stuff which they were weaving in cotton, particularly the shawls, have moved to all acrylic, which is sold in the local market. So that's the kind of degradation which has started happening in invariably in all the clusters. 
So essentially, the problem which we were looking at as a design problem or a marketing problem uh, or or a drift of the artisan was lying somewhere else. It was lying in the way the business uh, and the market has shifted. Uh, Namrata, will you be able to put this slide? So just ten more seconds. Yeah, sure. ऑडियंस <laughs> Slide five. Yeah, I mean, uh, we may move further. So, um, this was the graph which I wanted to show that there's a that it all starts with assumed competition with power loom, and it moves towards uh, degradation in in the type of yarn which they use, and then gradually it moves towards artificial fibers and towards. Poorer quality of dyes, naphthol-based dyes, which are hazardous both for skin and for the environment, and then gradually uh, the pre-loom ecosystem also withers away, and finally the cluster becomes defunct. So uh, there are many, many clusters. I mean, beyond the famous and well-known clusters, which are silently dying away because nobody is aware of them, and the degradation is happening at a much faster pace. Namita, can we move ahead? Yeah, to the next slide, please. so uh, as i was mentioning that uh, the business practices have undergone uh, a paradigm shift in last two decades uh, uh, go please uh, to the previous slide please previous previous one uh, slide number 7 sir yeah, just before that just before that on this slide only start with the beginning uh, it's an animation so uh, on slide 7 yeah start start beginning uh, because of the market changes which have happened in last two decades and the changes are markets have become distinct markets have uh, uh, clearly become distinct earlier the uh, the sale was happening locally within the their uh, village area or the block or the district headquarters now the markets have moved beyond the state geographies and have moved to the national and the international level second thing which is how which has also happened is the kind of education which artisans had uh, in terms of weaving the products and selling it to the local markets also has undergone a shift because right now they do not have understanding and exposure of the markets where the current product has a potential to sell Uh, ways of do, doing business has changed. Smartphone has become the tool uh, for everyone to take things forward. And lastly, unfortunately, there are very few or no institutions which can cater to very specific need of educating the artisans on these areas which are needed for dealing with the 21st century market. Apart from that, the other changes which have happened, uh, number that you can uh, scroll down further, are shift from the natural dyes. to artificial dyes uh, shift from natural fibers to largely artificial fibers in majority of the clusters shift from hand spun to largely mill spun barring exceptional cases and from weaving bespoke unique designs to weaving mass production now these changes which we are observing are the root cause of the are the root cause of the problem which we are seeing in terms of drift of the artisans so when we look when we, when we were looking at design is a problem or marketing is a problem perhaps we were missing on these areas which have very subtly Uh, have changed. Can we move on to the next slide, please? And essentially, what this boils down to is, if let's say the weavers were producing uh, bespoke products and in in better in in and in, in bet, uh, using natural fibers and using hand spun uh, uh, fiber and using uh, the natural dyes, they were essentially acting in the category of kalakas, which has now uh, drifted towards the category of mazdoors. So uh, when we were conceptualizing the entire program, we had a couple of questions before ourselves. First question was, is the craft form? commercially viable when we are looking at craft based livelihood that has to have a commercial viability one 
the and the second fundamental question which is uh, associated with uh, commercial viability is can that commercial viability be translated into remunerative livelihood for artisans or not so we try to answer these two questions and then move forward next slide please we did an assessment uh, uh, with couple of uh, market interfaces who have been working for uh, the artisans in last 65 70 years and these includes master weavers collectives such as producer companies and cooperatives and the benevolent not for profits uh, surprisingly in all three cases uh, as i was mentioning i mean this was for the commercially active firms we were looking at craft based livelihoods other two buckets we were not uh, look at in the current presentation let's move forward namrita next please so as we mentioning that uh, when we analyze the three market interfaces we realize that all three market interfaces whether it was master weavers uh, collectives uh, be it producer companies or cooperatives or benevolent not for profits in general invariably artisans income has remained between 3000 to 7000 rupees a month and this is an income which is not uh, sufficient for a next generation weaver or an artisan to continue within the same trade with the same amount of respect and dignity which they are expecting from this vocation so there are a couple of fundamentals which we learned from our study one was that uh, weavers would be able to earn best if they speak to markets directly and therefore whatever intervention we design for the craft based livelihood program must uh, ensure that there is an element of teaching the entrepreneurship uh, elements second thing was that whatever we do we have to make sure that core strength of hand woven textiles is returned back in case that the degradation has happened towards artificial fibers or poor quality of dyes the reversal also happens third thing which the craft based livelihood program mantra uh, tried to do was that whatever intervention we take up we need to understand that it cannot be a template driven intervention wherein you decide a course work for a four month or a six month or a eight month program and you would assume that all of the viewers would be able to take match up with that pace each viewers understanding is at a different level so therefore whatever educational endeavor happens there is a common basic course work for everyone but the course work remains open for the others who are not able to cover up within the basic course work so there is a hands on education which continues next uh, element was that uh, this education which will happen has to happen uh, within the village setting in the vernacular language you have beautiful design and business institutions you have beautiful viewer service centers all of these are located far away from uh, many of these clusters now what happens is uh, for weavers what they are doing right now is part of their livelihood for them to leave that and go for an education becomes very difficult so unless and until the education which are providing as a part of the craft based livelihood unless and until that happens right uh, in the village and at their convenient time they may not be able to take the full benefit of it so these were the four uh, five key fundamental principles which we decided to include as a part of the antaran which is a craft based livelihood program next one next slide please next one so the focus uh, was on uh, aspirational weavers and creative weavers whom we call as karigar and kalakar so we are not looking at the third category Uh, which is doing the uh, craft work primarily because they have to do it. So there, those who have element of creativity and some degree of aspiration associated with the craft are the ones who are being focused as a part of this uh, exercise. Uh, we provide them incubation and design education. We open up IDCs, incubation design centers in each of these clusters, and the objective is to nurture the artisans into artisan entrepreneurs and artisan designers. Next, please. so the course work uh, which uh, around which uh, the education happens which is very hands on is on uh, around barefoot business management textile design verbal and non verbal communication and use of it tools and social media for business next please this education is uh, pretty hands on it's not a regular classroom education so let's say if the computer literacy part happens it's not necessary that we have to take them through all the elements of computer so let's say if they have to develop a mood board which has to be sent over an email to the buyer so basic thing what what they need to do is to uh, to get an ability to draw the mood board on ms word so that's something which uh, which is taught to the artisans second level if costing is something which becomes difficult for them to do on pen and paper because it becomes repetitive and time consuming so can they learn to use basics of excel to do costing on their own and have a template ready from where they can very easily uh, change the costings if the parameters are changed and update the buyer the education should be by the practitioners real life situations for artisans to correlate uh, along with the education which happens in the idcs and in the village a lot of exposure to markets is also provided so so this year the artisans participated in india in their fashion week the products were also presented in maison objet in paris 
so the that is the kind of exposure and education uh, exposure which uh, adds on to the education which is being imparted next please now what is uh, very important uh, to realize and understand is uh, for artisans to learn and absorb uh, these concepts whether it's related to textile design or related to supply chain issues or related to communication with buyers it's very important that this, this happens in a drip irrigation mode it happens it should happen in smaller doses but at regular intervals so therefore the workshop mode of educating the artisans hasn't uh, been able to deliver and make strong change in the uh, weaving ecosystem so therefore as a part of this program design what we did was we have deputed qualified teams of textile designers and business management professionals in the cluster who take up classes at the time when the artisans are available so for example in case of mania bandhe in odisha uh, what we do is weavers become free in the evening at 6 o'clock so 6 to 9 is when their classes happen so that's when they start learning uh, uh, what they actually need that's, that's where they start valuing the education which they are receiving next please as i mentioned that uh, the education has to be in sync with uh, the market realities i'll cover that in the uh, subsequent slide so that learning and earning can go parallelly so as a part of the core program design what is very important for uh, others if they are looking at designing the craft based uh, livelihood program so make sure that whatever we do learning and earning should go parallelly we cannot exclude both the things and assume that they can come for a couple of weeks or couple of months for educational program leave their livelihood behind and will be able to reconnect with what they were doing earlier so it's very important that whatever educational endeavor happens for upgrading their skills should happen in vernacular language at their doorstep and at the as per the convenience of the artisans next one please and while we are doing this it is important that you all someone also looks at strengthening the ecosystem because what uh, has essentially happened is when number of weavers had started moving out from these clusters and they have left weaving the pre loom and the post loom service providers have also kind of moved out uh from these uh, clusters and therefore those also need to be strengthened so as an example let's say uh, if the team selects artisans who are at kalakar and karigar level then uh, what we do this is just one example of how the education happens so there is a group there is a group of caring and sensitive buyers who are associated with uh, trust in different form so what we do is we organize video calls uh, of the artisan with the buyer now buyer shares his or her requirement with the artisan by artisan notes it down so there is a process documentation which we teach to the artisan so that they know how do you note down the buyer's requirement in a certain format which would can be shared with the buyer for a common understanding next please then artisans based on what they have learned uh, 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 in the design classes for drawing inspiration for developing the mood board they do it on paper then as i mentioned they they use ms word till the time they are not adapt to using the design softwares they use basic ms the mood board next one please next slide please and then in the subsequent class uh, class they are taught use of email and that's where they get introduced to how do you attach a file to the email send it to the buyer get a response read the response and reply to the buyer and then the sub, the next steps uh, about which they are already aware of how do you source the raw material but the key step is which they miss out is when they when they begin the process of sampling or production they somehow miss to update the buyer on a regular basis so that is something which you try to ingrain within the artisan so that buyers are also in loop in terms of what is happening in the production cycle so uh, what we are trying to essentially do is to make sure that there is a sync between the artisans and the buyers artisans understand why buyers are not so keen in working with individual artisan entrepreneurs uh, what are the difficulties they face we try and equip the artisan entrepreneurs to get rid of those difficulties uh, difficulties are very very fundamental uh, artisans uh, limited ability to communicate with buyer to update the buyer over whatsapp or email or convey if this if something is not doable at the moment or if there are any challenges related to uh, related to rain related to any other issues within the village so uh, that buyer is updated and buyer can also express very candidly how he or she can manage in the given circumstances next please and this is how the development cycle of the new samples and the orders commences and uh, we take this exercise initially through caring and sensitive buyers and then we let them open up and start working with uh, other uh, buyers in general so that they also understand the core realities of the market next please next please next slide please namrita next slide please
Can you talk us to the next slide? Sir? I'm conscious that we've already crashed into our next hour, Shadra. I'm really sorry to uh, rush you on. Okay, thanks a lot, Shadra. Um, is Namrata able to hear me? Screen is gone, I believe. Uh, I think her net, internet got disconnected. She's trying connecting. We've lost internet connectivity. Oh, here we go. Okay. To slide 14, Namrata. So this is slide 14. Um, before that, uh, um, just start for the graph which you were showing, the flow chart which you were showing. Can I operate the screen from here? No. No. Can you go back, please? Yeah. Yeah. This, this one? one? Yeah, sure. Now, towards the end. Towards the end. Please keep clicking. Uh, right. So, uh, towards in the participation in the fashion weeks and trunk shows happen. Now, uh, these are a couple of illustrations. Next, please. Next one, please. Uh, so, these are a couple of illustrations how artisans have been communicating with bias directly. So, what happens is the moment uh, they take up exercises with caring and sensitive bias initially, then we open up with larger bias. So, let's say you can see on the screen it includes Raymond, Indy, Cotton, and Nalis and Jamini Paris. So, then what happens is these, uh, we form WhatsApp groups or email groups wherein um, uh, artisans start communicating with buyers. So, in one of the first illustrations, you can see that uh, Akula Nandi, who is an artisan in Maniavan, he sent the bill to the buyer and updated him and then sought his feedback that this is the courier and courier receipt number. Similarly, uh, in case of the second slide, you can see that the buyer's name is Shalini Sol uh, Solujan and the viewer's name is Zuri. And Zuri is updating the buyer. Uh, buyer asked for certain photographs and videos for her promotion of the products and that viewer was able to do. So these are a couple of requirements which buyers had. So artisans also started understanding how do you address buyer's requirement. Next one, please. And you can see it's a mix, mix of Hindi and English the way communication happens. So language no longer remains a barrier. There are a couple of other communication examples with Nali Silk and uh, with Akansh and, uh, and Feroza Begum conveying with Tan Tanvi, which is Tamarind Chutney in, uh, in US. Next one, please. Next one, please. Next, please. These are illustrations which I have uh, shared for reference that how that education actually translates into business. The artisans have moved on to the Instagram and they're regularly interacting with buyers, updating about their products and events where they're participating. Next one, please. Now, uh, parallelly, when the education part is happening and the market linkage is happening as a part of the craft-based livelihood intervention, it is very important there is a due assessment of the artisan entrepreneur's progress is carried out. And the assessment uh, shouldn't only for be for the business progress. It should also be for areas where how are, how are they faring in terms of their communication skills? How are they using their digital skills? How are they using basic business management skills uh, for managing the production and supply chain issues? Because unless and until they have the entire set of uh, skills uh, embedded within them, they will not be able to prosper once the program is over. So it's very important for sustenance of the program that you do a qualitative assessment beyond the quantitative part. I'll give you an example in the next slide. Next one, please. So here you can see that artisans are being regularly graded on their skills on social media, on engagement in social media, quality of content which they put in, use of smartphone for communicating with buyers, their order coordination, their production update. So that's how uh, we are able to keep track of their progress. So it's not just about uh, making sure that they do good business. It's also about they do it in a right manner and they understand the requirements of the market while they're learning and earning parallelly. With this, I'd like to uh, close the presentation. If there are questions, I'd love to answer. Thank you very much, Shadi, for such a comprehensive presentation. Um, I think there are various comments and questions in the chat function. It might be just a mindful of time, be easier to, if you could address those directly online. Um, and we'll, we'll move to our next speaker. But again, thank you very much, Shadi. It's an astonishing 
level of detail in terms of the work that Tato is, is engaging with in terms of the community and, and the craft. Um, Thank and you, Jonathan. Is uh, Omi Gurang, who's a designer and social entrepreneur, also known as the, the Green Man of Sikkim, and is the uh, 50, 50 Himalayan heroes by Condé Nast Traveller. And I'm going to move on now with some pace to uh, Omi, over to you. Hello everyone, very good afternoon. My topic for today is role of design to address the impact of COVID-19 and sustainable fashion. How, uh, how audible? It, it's, quite a, it's quite a dodgy line, I think, Omi. It kind of every, every third word we're kind of getting through. Hello. So you try and persist, I'm going to see how we go, and then we may just swap our, our order around and come back to you in a minute, but just keep going for now, and let's see how we get on. So have we lost Omi? I think we might have done. I'm not quite sure, but I think we may have lost Omi. Uh, can someone who's got control of the site just confirm? Have we lost Omi online? I think, uh, I think his internet is a bit... Am I audible? You're audible. Oh, here we go. Okay, Omi is back. Okay, Omi, back to you. Okay, am I audible to you all? We can okay, hi, good now. afternoon. Yeah. All right, all right, no issue. My topic for today is role of designer to address the impact of COVID-19 on sustainable fashion. Before I speak on sustainable fashion, we need to understand what is sustainability. Sustainability is the ability to sustain natural resources in order to maintain ecological balance. When we talk about sustainability, we need to take three aspects of factor into consideration and they are environment, economy, and social. Environment is nature, economic. Oh, Omi, we've, lo we've lost you again. I think the, your Wi-Fi stability is a bit here and there. Um, uh, perhaps we'll come back to you in a, in a few moments, just in case we lose you again, um, if that's okay. Um, uh, so, oh. Jonathan, hi. Okay, hi, Omi. Okay, over to you. So we will so send our user dial-in feature because I think the network is quite bad. Should should we come back to you in, a, in five minutes and shift our running order around? Would that be okay, Omi? Whilst and see if it, it improves shortly. All right, no problem. That will not be an issue. Yeah, thank, thanks, Amy. We'll, we'll come back to you shortly. Um, so we'll move now to a um, quick skip round to uh, Dr. Sripana Banwa. Apologies if I've made, made a mess of your name there, but Dr. Banwa is the head of Centre for Industrial Ex Extensions and Indian Institute of Entrepreneurs. And Dr. Bahwa will be speaking to us this afternoon on the role of uh, how you can leverage training support through institutional incubation. Dr. Bahwa, over to you. Hi, are you there? So, very good afternoon. Am I audible? Am I audible? Yeah. Am I audible? Can I start? You can, please do. Thank you very much. And only if you can go on to the over to you, Dr. Bauer.
Am I audible, no? You are, I suspect we may have a similar question regarding the, the connectivity, but have a go and see how, how long it lasts. Yes, okay. can I, am I audible? You, you are, yeah. yes. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, um, let me start. So, yeah. A very good afternoon. Yeah, a very good afternoon. So here I am. Um, uh, today the, I'm going to talk more on the, you know, incubation, the support and sustainability of through incubation support, capacity development, building and sustainability through incubation. I would like to first start with a journey because I represent the entrepreneurship. I would like to start with the journey of entrepreneurship way back when we started working on um, handloom, the craft and handloom sector on a, way back in 2007 on a project mode. That's when we started working with a lot of clusters in the handloom and the craft sector. The approach that we have been taking since then is that we work on clusters where we, you know, we start with a proper diagnostic diagnosis of I think we've lost um, we've lost Dr. Bahwa as well. Gremlins in, in the Wi-Fi connectivity, I think. Oh dear. Um, Omi, are you, are you there? Sorry for all of our viewers online that were um, experiencing the technical constraints. Um, Omi, are you there? Okay, am I audible to you? Hi, hi, am I audible? Uh, you're audible loud and clear. Yeah, let's go back to you, Omi. Okay, okay. Okay, before I speak on sustainable fashion, we need to understand what is sustainability. Sustainability is the ability to sustain natural resources in order to maintain ecological balance. And we talk about sustainability, we need to understand or take into consideration three important factors that they are environment economy and social. When I talk about environment, it means nature. When I talk about economy, it means profit and social as people. With the outbreak of coronavirus, the pandemic forced us all to confinement and unified isolation at home. And it has directly affected the... <laughs> Think, Hello. Hi. Okay, you're back. Okay. Yeah. So the outbreak of coronavirus, you know, ban um, forces to confinement and unified isolation at home, and um, it has directly affected the social and economical aspect. Whereas there is a positive impact on environment. According to Center for Research in Energy and Clean Air. India's carbon dioxide emission did fall for really sorry, Omi. We've we've lost you again. Um, I suspect we we may have a continuing cycle of in out in out. Really sorry um, for those who are watching online. Um, oh, okay, I'm just going to get him on my phone to see if I can make it work that way. Omi, hi. 
Sorry, we've, we've lost you again, Omi. Really sorry that this is... Uh... Okay. okay. Yeah, I'm here. It's all right. So uh, this is a big call, you know, coronavirus pandemic is a big call from the earth to slow down and make a shift towards being sustainable. And when we talk about being sustainable, it means taking into consideration the future generation too. Um, Sustainable fashion is an ethical fashion that has positive impact on environment, society, and economy at large. As a designer of a designer's social entrepreneur, post COVID 19 hair arts and steps or ideas that can be of great help. Number one, you need to get inventory. Your stock needs to go. You need to push the shelves, you know, be it discount or hold exhibition or pop up. Or even if required, keep the season. You have buffer, buffer time in October. If you need to pre fall, uh, you know, you can put up the sale. Next week to cycle, make use of what you already have. Upcycling is the process of using open the new to make something brand new. It is said for one ton of fabric that's. Omi, I fear we, we've lost you again on online. And that's the Hi. Okay, so I was talking about upcycling. Upcycling, you know, when you upcycle products, like one ton of fabric. Hello? Hi. Hi, yeah. Hi, yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, so I continue my... Uh, all right. See, as a designer, a poster on Twitter, who COVID 19 hair pops, you can the ideas that can be a great help. Number one, we can make inventory. Do you have any stock? We can Can you hear Omi? Omi, um, yeah, I'm really sorry. We, we, we're really struggling with, I think, the tech and we are trying all, all directions to try and get the audibility going. Um, if you don't mind, we, we'll take a pause. The subconscious of people online will be struggling to be able to stitch your story together, given the technical difficulties that we are experiencing. Um, let's um, just go... We'll see if we can okay, come. Jonathan, I will just wrap it. Jonathan, I will just wrap up in a very uh, okay. Thanks, form, everyone. You know? Okay. Okay. So you you need to have a mindful creation that leads to mindful consumption. Choose friendly fabric sourced locally. Employ local artists and craftsmen. Go local and be vocal. You know, for example, if you choose cotton, it takes four to five months to decompose. Whereas polyester takes 200 years. So that is the difference. Quality over quantity. Practicality over vanity. You know, I think the trend will also be towards more holistic and minimalistic fashion. Fabric care will be, again, a prior importance because 25% of the carbon footprint of clothes come from the way we care for them. And extending the life cycle of a clothing by further nine months could reduce carbon waste and water footprints for around 20 to 30 percent. 
and post COVID-19, I think fashion communication is also uh, will play a vital role in building a brand image. Effective communication will be the key. So if you We've, we've lost Omi again, I'm really sorry. If, uh, I think we've lost Omi. Give me five minutes, I'll just wrap up. So if you see not this is very rich in craft, but many are unaware of it. For example, we have Ahian Star, Airy Silk from Assam or Meghalaya. We have Naga Shawl and Naga Woven Fabric from Nagaland. Madipuri Woven Fabric from Nipur. Nipcha Woven Fabric from Sikkim. And also Asrani or Sikh Fiber Woven Fabric uh, from Sikkim. So we need to communicate this kind of textile heritage to the world outside. Fashion communication will be the key post COVID-19. And if at all this pandemic has taught us I mean, we've, we've lost you, I think, for your okay. final few moments. I'm and really sorry. All this pandemic has taught us something, and it is resilience. We need to see this pandemic as an opportunity to reset ourselves and build a new system that is sustainable. Because if there is no nature, there will be no future. Thank you. Thank you, for me, and thanks for um, battling on with the technology. I think your final point there is the most uh, most critical. Without yes, there is no future, there is no yeah. future. So Absolutely. we need to be sustainable. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Um, we, Thank we, you. We'll move along uh, to uh, and return to Dr. Bahua um, and hope that the internet connectivity is, is uh, more stable now for the time being. Over to you. Yeah. Uh, very good afternoon. I had just started, but let me just go back to where I had started. You know, we, um, I represent the Indian Institute of Entrepreneurship. And as an institute, we have been working on the craft and the handloom sector from, for more than 14, 15 years now. And our experience as far as working in the craft and handloom sector has been primarily on the project mode. When I say project mode, what we do is we start with uh, most of the projects that we take up in the craft and handloom sector. We start with a you know diagnostic study. It's like diagnosing in a particular cluster what are the basic issues, what are the concerns. We do a, a diagnostic study, find out the critical concerns in the particular sector, and then we draw up an action plan as to what can be, what needs to be done, both as far as backward integration is required and as far as for forward in integration is required. And finally, what we do is we also help in setting up some physical structure, which we call it a common facility center, we call it an incubation center. And this physical structure tries to solve a lot of things, issues in terms of, although we're talking about craft, although we're talking about handloom, there is a little bit of technology which is also required in maybe in pre-processing, processing. So these type of technology and concerns about quality where you can do the quality testing, etc. concerns about dyeing, these are set, setups which we, these are, you know, facilities that we set up in a particular cluster which helps in becoming a sort of a center in which people come and commonly use the infrastructure which is created there. Uh, so, um, so for example, when we talk about a handloom, for example, a handloom cluster, there are a lot of pre-loom activities in terms of warping. Normally what happens in Northeast um, is that most of the villages, even the pre-loom process takes a lot of time. So we don't have a big warping drum. Even setting up a big warping drum in, enhances their productivity because they can all come and you know uh, it, it's not weather dependent it's in a particular structure etc so these are some things which they come use it and then they go back to their house and start doing the rest of their activities again for final you know they, whether it's for dyeing whether it is for quality testing etc they come back to the common facility center and the approach that we also take is setting up of uh, you know some um, cooperative you call it a cooperative, a producer company um, with the cluster artisans, with someone taking a lead. So that is how a structure is, has been built up. Now talking, uh, taking from there, 
And these centers that we set up, they help in continuously upskilling of the artisans, which is required. And design is not a one-time intervention. There's a continuous need for design intervention. Now these things automatically start taking up, take happening in these structure, in these facilities which are created. I would specifically like to draw my, uh, my experience, particularly from two big clusters in which I was personally involved. One is a handloom cluster in Manipur, which covered about 3,000 weavers. Uh, this was a, a first project that we had taken up, and this was way back in 2007. Now, these, um, when we started, when I said we do a diagnostic study, when we start, first did the diagnostic study, the main issue that we found there was, you know, there were two major concerns there. While their weave was good, excellent, they, you know, Manipuris are known for their excellent weaves, but the major problem that we found was their raw material supply. You know, there was a fluctuation in price and as well as the quality of raw material, the yarn which is available in the market. The second problem which we found was that there were no profession. Dyeing was a big issue. So we, when we uh, took the intervention, these are the two major challenges we tried to address. When we tried to look at the yarn, which continues to become a remain a problem in many of the clusters throughout the Northeastern region, what we did was we had helped them and that is not that we set up a dyeing uh, a yarn center for them we took it on a ppp mode helped um, our artisans entrepreneurs from that particular region to take up a yarn, your raw material bank on a ppp private pu public partnership mode because as we know government has a lot of schemes uh, but often the schemes and as who's going to you know take advantage of the schemes there's a gap in terms of schemes availability and people who can actually use it so we became the facilitating body to help them set up a yarn bank so that was done through an entrepreneur from that particular pocket you know we are the strategy that we adopted was identify entrepreneurs master weavers because we need people who have a sense of the market Normally, whenever we go to the cluster, we try to identify people who have a sense of the market, who understands, you know, business. So there in Manipur cluster, we found two, three women who were already doing well in business. And we tried to bring them as social entrepreneurs in this particular cluster. So they understood the need for setting up a yarn bank. So we helped them set up a yarn bank, which is a government sponsored scheme. And we set up a yarn bank. So what happened in the cluster was a problem of availability of yarn or raw material was immediately solved with the setting up of yarn bank. Because what happened in a yarn bank, you get quality yarn at a mill gate price. And there's also a transport sub subsidy available for getting, uh, setting up the yarn, uh, for getting the yarn. So they, one major problem was solved, that is getting quality yarn. So this is going as far as the as far as the backward integration is concerned. Next problem which we tried to do solve was doing a lot of dyeing training, capacity building in dyeing. So the cluster started having about 14, 15 professional dyers there. So now this then what you know what was uh, mostly handloom is an activity along with agriculture. People start take are involved because here in Northeast we have mostly 90% of the weavers are women weavers. So it's often a part-time activity. So part-time activity to, for them to find more meaning in handloom as an activity comes in only when they get us, you know, when they start earning. So this started happening when with the same amount of effort with the quality yarn, they were getting a better price. There was value addition. So having done all that, what we also then facilitated was setting up of a common facility center, which, which turned out to be like an incubation center there. Now this common facility center had certain equipments in terms of, as I said, you know, large um, size of the uh, loom because, you know, they, in Manipur at that time, they were all using small size looms. They were making bed covers, but the bed covers were very beautiful, but then they always has to use to have a stitch in between because the size of the looms were very small. So through this center, we set up big size looms. These entrepreneurs then realized that, you know, someone took charge uh, the master weavers took charge and they started supplying to rest of india while the weaves were while the bed covers were beautiful but because of the stitch so we solved the problem by setting up a big size loom uh, then we also had testing labs etc so people started getting motivated um, and what well, the most interesting part which happened was the second generation next generation when they found that this is a profitable business the second generation also came in so whenever they wanted they used the common facility center to the extent they wanted and as they grew up 
from artisan to uh, uh, micro ent entrepreneurs. You know, we also took a strategy that you know, everyone need not be dominated by a few mm -hmm. master weavers, which normally happens. So our effort continuously was to also give them financial linkage so that they eventually come out and become micro entrepreneurs, MSME sector, they come into the MSME sector. So this is a continuous process which happens, new types of weavers keep coming. So, and then we also help them to get into, uh, uh, so uh, we also help them to get into like a common brand. So few of them come, we have come up with a, um, uh, encompassing a large number of weavers have come up with their own brand also. We helped them set up a marketing consortia. So this is a model we found uh, to be very, very uh, effective and it's still a sustainable pocket. Although the VI as an institute, we exited about in way back, maybe six, seven, eight years back itself, we exited from this cluster. But even now, it's a sustainable project which is going on. So this is one which we did in Manipur. Similar other clusters we've done, but again, one experience that we've realized is that, you know, if the cluster doesn't have, you know, entrepreneurs or master weavers who are slightly, you know, different, uh, slightly have a commercial, who have a commercial sense, it's difficult to actually make the entire, all artisans understand the, get a sense of the market. And that's where the middleman starts taking advantage. So everywhere that we, whichever cluster that we go, we try to identify who could be the key players. So once they see a success story coming out from the particular village, others start following. So another cluster which we had worked and I had personally worked was in Assam. You know, the entire cluster is on natural dye. Unlike the Manipur cluster where people were already into um, weaving, they were already skilled. Here, what was happening was their skill set was limited. So, and, but then they were doing this natural, um, they, they were doing airy silk and they never realized that airy silk is a you know, non-violent silk and it has such a huge market. They never realized. So this entire village is, we, we did some natural dye programs and the entire village is now doing natural dye. Now, unlike the Manipur cluster where we set up a, a common facility center in this particular village, because we didn't have any uh, uh, entrepreneurs in the cluster, so all artisans, we couldn't graduate into setting up a common facility center. Now, what happens? Suppose there is a common facility center in this particular village. Then what happens is that they can continuously keep on upskilling, keep on doing design upgradation, which is now not being possible because of the absence of a, such a center there. So the point which I'm trying to drive is any cluster that we take up, incubation support is extremely important at the grassroots level. When there's an incubation support there, incubation in terms of physical infrastructure available, in term, and where people get access to technology, where people get access to design, then you know continuous upscaling market and the second generation also can get involved. Now, in the current context of COVID, I find this is even more important because, you know, I, I've heard my previous speakers talking about things like, you know, how do I get access to, how do I communicate my, my weavers, etc. Suppose we have a good digital infrastructure also. Now, this has become man, almost a necessity now. We've all realized, suppose we have a good in digital infrastructure. So far, that was not thought about in these incubation centers. Suppose we have a digital infrastructure in place. What happens, even the skill training programs, upskilling can continuously keep happening at the grassroots level. Then even designs can be done. Upskilling can be done, designs can be done. And it'll be very much possible that now that the migrants are coming back. So many of the migrants, particularly when we talk about Assam, had gone to places like Gujarat, et cetera. And many of them are involved in the textile industry. Now they're coming back, they have the exposure. They also have, a, they're much more educated than their parents. So they can use what we're talking about, direct linkage, you know, these platforms for directly marketing their products and look at and help in making more, these, you know, pockets more sustainable. Often these craft and handloom are not sustainable because the next generation is not coming into it. So this can be an opportunity. Incubation can be a big support. Um, you know, and uh, there are also other crafts. I've just talked about handloom. There are crafts uh, like, you know, even the uh, jewelry, for example. There are jewelry pockets in Assam. There are jewelry pockets in Manipur, where we are also working. And we are now in the process of setting up such support in your common facility centers in these, um, uh, you know, in these pockets. 
there a lot of you know and then what the other aspect is that when we talk about export from a village rural area how can we think about export export would require a lot of quality stringent quality and how much you know uh, an entrepreneur from the city can continuously handhold so huge part of the job can be done not by a middleman but by someone from the cluster itself and so we are breaking away middleman and we directly connecting so this is what i would say in the pre covid post covid era i think incubation is an answer craft based incubation is an answer for uh, sustainability thank you very much thank you very much so i think it's a very key point in terms of building the capacity from within the cluster to ensure that it sustains uh, as opposed to requiring that third party expertise to or the the, the mediator in terms of uh, reaching a market and also sustaining the community's work in the intervening time that thank you very much for all of our first uh, four panelists and for the insight and sharing with such generosity and persistence Uh, we will now move on to our second second panel. So this this second panel will actually talk about how do we accelerate technology uh, to the advantage of meeting the challenges of course of COVID nineteen pandemic, especially on livelihood, and how can women entrepreneurs and artisans uh, use this to their advantage? Given the fact, like what Dr. Abhijit has mentioned, that uh, we are still technologically very challenged, especially in remote areas of Northeast India. Uh, so we will start with this. Uh, before that, uh, I would like to thank our uh, media partner, Mr. Amit Patro from Sikkim Express. Uh, he will be covering this uh, webinar on his uh, uh, newspaper as well as he is sharing it live on his Facebook page. So I will uh, say that one more time. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and shared live on all the Facebook page of all the agencies collaborating for this webinar. And thank you to all our state partners uh, who are here joining in for the webinar and listening to us, uh, as well as our designers, Nandini, uh, and our uh, Impulse Media Press Lab member, Kunal Majumdar. Uh, so that's about it. Uh, Jonathan, over to you. Thanks very much, Emmerine. And uh, so we'll move swiftly on in terms of the next session as seamlessly as possible. Uh, tech permitting um, and and as Emily says we'll look at digital platforms and how financing and marketing can also and how they can connect finance and marketing to empower women especially over this COVID-19 period and with that we'll we'll move to our next speaker this afternoon can I just but for just yeah. one minute so there is a feedback form I have shared on the chat box if you can if you guys can have a look at it uh, you know give your feedback to the first panel discussion uh, that will be so helpful for us thank you so much and we will we will be sharing the same feedback form right after the end of the second panel discussion as well thank you sorry John thanks very much thank you very much and so to um, hand over now to Karma Pajor who is the chief editor of East Mojo and co-founder of the and the infotainment and is also an award-winning journalist in his own right from his previous and I'm um, assuming still current career in broadcast journalism. Karma, over to you. Karma? I think your mic turned off, Karma. Unmute my mic. Yeah. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes. Loud and clear. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I'm just going to quickly rattle through uh, what, uh, you know, the presentation I have. Uh, basically talking about how do you incorporate storytelling? Uh, how do you reach out to your, uh, you know, the, the people uh, that you want to reach out to, how you want to sell your product out there? Because today there is a lot of clutter. Uh, too much uh, in the social media space. Now, every social media uh, platform there is uh, speaks a different language in a way, although it's all there to convey one message, that is to get your message out to the world.
but every platform has a different language. So it has to be handled in a different way. Uh, I would say bottom line, uh, you know, I've experimented with print journalism. I worked with the Times of India. Then I uh, worked uh, for more than 18 years in television. Uh, for the last three years, I've been learning a lot about digital. Uh, the beauty of digital is that you keep learning, you know, uh, nobody's an expert. Uh, I might think that X might work, X will work for a day and tomorrow X will flop miserably. And, you know, so, so in, in the digital world, you need to learn, know your limitations. So what are your limitations today? We are having limitations as far as the Northeast is concerned uh, in terms of uh, internet connectivity. You know, we struggle through it, but still there are pockets where internet, where internet connectivity is good. So we have to use that to our advantage. Now, as far as storytelling is concerned, what are the kind of stories that work? Uh, till now, what we've discovered, and uh, we've been running East Mojo for like, what, uh, almost two years now, what the stories that connect with the people, the stories that have maximum engagement, the stories that are shared, talked about, are stories which are personal. Uh, so you have to get yourself out there. Uh, just making a beautiful presentation, uh, a beautiful, nice, uh, a creative around your brand and putting it out there and thinking that people will reach out, that does not work most of the time. So if you're an entrepreneur, you have to place yourself out there for the world to see and tell them, look here, this is who I am and that is why you need to trust me and my product is going to be, bring you a world of good. Now people again are going to question, okay, we know you, but what, what's your product? So there, you also need to describe your surroundings. You need to understand the environment. Talk about the place you come from. Talk about why the product is unique. So while doing this, uh, you know, and you also need to speak their language. So what is the language? Who are the people that you want to reach out to? It depends. So if you want to reach out to uh, a, a tiny market that is around your own, uh, say, state, your own region, then you need to speak the language. If you want to reach out to entire Northeast, then you need to speak another language. So that is also important that you reach out. Uh, once you've formulated everything, once you've got your plan in place, once you've got, uh, you know, what you need to do, you need to look at your content. What content works for you? You need to also uh, take uh, into account internet, yes. Uh, if you think that you're going to go live on Facebook all the time and your internet is dodgy, you might not want to do that. You might want to record your videos. So little things like that um, work, uh, you know, for most entrepreneurs. So after you've told your story, you've uh, put it on Facebook, Instagram, social media, wherever, you can't wait for likes because, uh, you know, your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, they're going to come out and they're going to like it and say, wow, you've done a fantastic job. But beyond that, you're not going to go very far. So you're again constrained and limited to your little circle. You need to share. Where do you need to share? For that, you need to do research on what are the groups that are of interest that like the kind of things that you're doing. So you need to look for those groups. And then, so it's like, you know, in the media world, there are two phases. They are the content providers, then they are the distributors. You need to be your own distributor. You made the content but you need to distribute it to the right places. And when we say distribute it to the right places, once your story is out there, say you've done a beautiful um, a video about your village, about yourself, about your product, and it's wonderful, but you've got nobody to show. Uh, once, say, uh, local media, uh, say a television channel or a, or, a, or a website like ours, picks up your story, tells your story, that's good, because that's going to help you reach out to more people. And today in the media, uh, today in this digital world, there are influencers. There are lots of people. Uh, some of them have just made it by dancing for a few seconds uh, every evening. Uh, and they've got, uh, you know, thousands of followers. Uh, some guy just knows how to spray salt in a particular way. And, you know, people are enthralled. So that guy has about, what, a million plus uh, viewers. So you need to reach out to these people. Uh, you know, uh, ask them to give a shout out as the millennials, millennials say. Uh, so uh, that is going to help you get a greater audience. So connecting with influencers, uh, connecting with verified media channels, which have a wider reach is very, very crucial. Uh, 
you also need to update yourself all the time as to what is working, what is not working as far as the digital world is concerned once you've done your story. And of course, uh, the most important thing is consistency. Consistency is the most important thing. What happens is you make one video, you put out one creative, you tell one story. After that, you stopped thinking that people are going to just watch that and wait forever for you. That is not going to work. Uh, you have to have a content calendar, a plan, uh, just like, uh, you know, the, the advertising world has. So you say, I'm going to start in December. My product is going to be ready in December. From then on, you have an entire content plan every day or uh, every few days or once in a week. How do you plan that? You have a content calendar and uh, you release that particular story that you want to tell about a particular product at that time every day. So consistency, people love consistency. Once you announce that you're going to do something, you're going to show them how to make this wonderful scarf at four o'clock on Sunday when you're sitting down, sipping tea, relaxed. That's the time you need to come. Not at 4.30, not at five o'clock, not at six o'clock, not the next day, not the day after, but on the date that you promised. People like that. Uh, people then will start believing in you and believing in your product and believing in what you stand for. There are lots of entrepreneurs who've made, uh, uh, you know, uh, great businesses just by being on uh, the internet and, and showing off their products. Kickstarter, uh, if you go on Kickstarter, you'll see brilliant stories, well told. And, uh, you know, they, they managed to sell their products. So I guess uh, uh, these are more or less... Uh, uh, the important things uh, that you uh, want to keep in mind. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I could uh, come back uh, for more. Uh, over to you, Jonathan. Thanks. Thanks very much. I think that was so useful because it's looking at a kind of the relationship in terms of trust and reliability that is so key in terms of that sense of building your audience and building your building your repeat audience and your, your repeat buyers um, and how you and how how you use uh, media and technology to secure that sense of trust between your, your between your product, your own story as a maker, your community story where that you live in, and um, how you reach your how you reach your sales. Um, I wonder if you have any particular examples that you can that you could cite where you can see that really extraordinary quality of trust product and storytelling as an example that you could share with the group? Um, you know, the uh, example uh, that is uh, closest right now uh, is the product that I've started in the Northeast. I mean, I don't want to blow my own pipe, but that's something that I want to uh, cite with eastmojo.com. Uh, something incredible happened, uh, you know, uh, uh, because in the Northeast, football is very popular and uh, we wanted to cover a football match live in uh, Nagaland, which is, uh, uh, you know, known uh, in some pockets for the worst internet possible. Uh, you can't even send out a tweet, uh, you know, in, in Nagaland. So there was a, a government, uh, I think it was a, the organizers were going live on, on YouTube. So the organizers decided they had a broadband, they had broadband and they decided to go live on broadband. But again, because of the network issue, their uh, coverage was very patchy. So what I asked my correspondent to do is start sending us text messages. So there was a challenge, which is the internet. Now we moved around it and the correspondent is sending text messages to Guwahati, which is our headquarters. And somebody is updating those text messages on uh, our website. And I went to Google Analytics and something incredible happened. Suddenly I saw that there are thousand plus people sitting on our website at that time just to watch the live, uh, you know, uh, text uh, that we were playing out, uh, a live blog that we are playing out on, on, the, on the website. So because they were limited and I was baffled, I said, I told my editor, look here, I said, you know, they're running a live uh, video broadcast on YouTube, slightly patchy. They've got around 100, 200 viewers sitting on YouTube. But we have got a thousand plus viewers on a blog, you know, which is just text. You're not watching. You're not seeing football. I said, how is that? Then I have a young Naga boy coming from a very remote uh, place. He works for me and he handles our Instagram. 
He said, you know, the problem is in all these areas who are interested in watching that match, there is no, uh, you know, internet, the kind of uh, capacity that you have to watch, uh, that you can't watch video. So they are reading on the website and, and they're loving it that way. So, so, you know, that's a limitation and you have to work around limitation. And sometimes it works brilliantly. Fabulous. So it's about adapting, being inventive and using the technology in its different ways to, to support that. So useful. And, and th there are various questions and comments on the chat box. Please do um, take a look and if you're able to respond to them, a um, particular question regarding consistency and how you build consistency into your strategy to build, to build your audience. That would be useful. Um, we'll move to our, our next speaker, uh, which is, who is um, Babel Malik. And he's a co-founder of Karma Life, um, an AI-powered, 100% digital financial platform that provides resilience for low-income gig workers with fluctuating cash flows. And I think at this moment in time, that'll be fairly critical in terms of COVID-19 and cash flows being more and more hard to uh, win in terms of income um, and increasing their motivation and productivity in the workplace. Over to you. Thank you, Jonathan. Can you hear me and see me? Uh, with all the technology problems that have been going on? Okay, great. Uh, I have some slides. I, I, I just, you know, to help me kind of stay to script. Um, I'll just say, so, I mean, yeah, as, as Jonathan mentioned, I have been working for the last year or so on a venture uh, which uh, just got funded. We just got our funding during COVID and all of that. So, um, you know, we're pretty psyched about that. Uh, but uh, before that, I I uh, was, you know, I, I helped launched and, and, and built a platform called Catalyst, which was an action learning program focused on, uh, you know, digital finance and micro business. So I think a lot of the uh, learnings in terms of what I will speak to about today come from that. I've been, uh, even though uh, with Karma Life, uh, you know, our, our, our core audience right now is not, uh, you know, is not artisans, although, I mean, we definitely, you know, even in our pitch deck, we have uh, artisans as a future um, target segment. I have, uh, you know, through uh, talking with Hasina as well as uh, through other, uh, you know, professional kind of um, uh, opportunities engaged with the artisanal ecosystem, uh, particularly in Rajasthan, and, uh, you know, have some, some thoughts and understanding around how, uh, you know, digital can be used there and what also are some of the, uh, you know, the challenges. So, um, so this, hopefully this will be an interactive session and I'll, I'll, I'll share some thoughts and then would love to take questions. Um, do we have the presentation that we could probably just start, start yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I, I, I want to start by just, um, you know, uh, laying out, so you can go to the first slide. Thanks. Uh, uh, you know, so just laying out the, the, the ecosystem, the way I see it, right at the India wide level. Um, and we, can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, so um, so we we you know we have if you look at the artisanal ecosystem in India, we're talking about about you know seven million artisans. Um, you know, fifty percent plus are women, uh, of which you know the, the a large majority are are not literate. Uh, Eighty percent fall under you know uh, scheduled caste tribes, OBC categories. Um, you know, the women uh, index is particularly important if you look at you know, very dismal kind of female labor participation rate in India. Um, the crafts industry is, you know, in terms of, in terms of contribution to GDP, uh, it's, it's a 250 billion rupee industry, which is really just 0.5% or less than 0.5% of GDP, um, you know, versus say 30% in China. Or, you know, and, and if you look at it in terms of our global contribution, it's only, uh, you know, less than 2% of, of worldwide crafts uh, production. So it's, there's a huge, um, there is huge room to grow, 
right? I mean, that's that's what what this indicates, as well as the fact that um, you know it is it is very important from a it, it is a very strategic uh, sector from the standpoint of both job creation and economic growth, um, particularly for inclusive economic growth, right? Across uh, across segments that have otherwise been marginalized. So. Uh, so, so this is a major. I think it's a very important question uh, to be to be talking about. And uh, you know, the way I come to this is, you know, looking at opportunities for digital finance. And I, uh, I'll say up front that you can't, you cannot, you know, divorce, uh, you know, finance access to finance. And I actually think digital finance is short circuiting so many, uh, you know, ways to access finance that. Uh, it makes sense. I mean, there is no other way but to, you know, provide finance to informal communities like crafts ecosystems than to go digital, right? I mean, analog finance does, just does not work. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But, uh, but, but I think the key thing is to embed that finance very, uh, you know, kind of um, uh, deeply into livelihoods. Right? Because unless you, unless finance is solving livelihoods problems and uh, kind of integrated into livelihoods, it is not going to be adopted, right? And it won't have its um, its, its its influence or its impact. So, so I think uh, I mean that is that is one point I just wanted to make uh, clear. So, so when we talk about challenges around livelihoods, right? I mean. Finance is one component, a very important component of it, but it's not the only challenges, right? So I think other speakers who are on this panel, like Karma talked about uh, storytelling, right? I mean, that has to do with kind of, you know, marketing, the content, uh, you know, kind of uh, understanding the customer, building a relationship with the customer, uh, so on and so forth. Those are hugely important parts, uh, you know, in terms of creating market linkages, right? The marketing and distribution channels. I think Rajat will hopefully talk about some of that, but that is, that is another hugely important aspect. But on the finance side, you know, I mean, capital is obviously important. Like any small business, um, artisans need capital. They need capital in form of working capital, which is, you know, just capital to buy raw materials, capital to, you know, sort of um, um, uh, be able to, you know, um, hold on till you get delayed payments, for instance, right? Uh, they also need growth capital as they grow the business. So if the business is fundamentally strong uh, and, and, and is revenue generating, then uh, you need capital to invest in the business to increase the scale of the business and increase revenues, right? And that, that is the path towards growth uh, for any business and also job creation at the business level. Um, similarly, you need, um, you need social protection, right? Because most, as we know, uh, I mean, you know, artisanal ecosystems are, at least at the grassroots level, are are most, you know, are, are largely characterized by informal contracts. So there is no social protection in terms of, you know, insurance, uh, maternity leave, you know, uh, healthcare related, um, you know, uh, uh, safety nets and so on and so forth. Right. So social protection, again, is a broader concept, but part of that is linked to uh, access to finance, right? Particularly when you're talking about insurance, when you're talking about, uh, you know, pension for old age security, so on and so forth. So uh, I'll touch upon some of those aspects as I go along. So let's move uh, forward, please. Yeah, so uh, so one, one thing I wanted to also introduce is what we call the fourth industrial revolution, right? And so you have to kind of understand the state of technology and, and uh, you know, what it encompasses to really understand what the opportunities are. Uh, so, you know, we, 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 we call, you know, we are at the fourth, I mean, there've been three industrial revolutions before us, before now, and, and the fourth industrial revolution is all around digital and data and, 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 and uh, you know, uh, artificial intelligence and so on and so forth, right? So, so this really has to, I mean, the way to understand this is that A, um, you know, the, the mobile phone, has become such a universal form factor that it has become both a communication channel but also a, a data channel, right? And India, if you if you know, is actually amongst the highest consuming um, 
you know, data, uh, data consumption countries. Uh, it's, it's, and it's growing. So uh, the amount of data, right, that, that, is, um, that, that is generated through the mobile phone is, is just staggering. Uh, and there's a lot that one can do with that data, right? Um, and, and do it in a way that is, you know, that, that, that you know, I mean, I know this, there, there are privacy safeguards and a lot of other things that one needs to take into account. But again, we're talking about a, a, a segment, right? And not just artisans, but, you know, any, a lot of informal workers where there is no other, um, you know, kind of formal identity. I, they, I mean, they don't have, you know, I mean, 80% of folks have bank accounts, but only 13%, uh, you know, have access to formal credit, right? So just to give you an example, uh, the, the day, it, it, but everybody has a, has, has a mobile phone. And there's a there's, there's a data asset there that can be leveraged to, uh, you know, kind of bring them into the world of finance. And so that is that is important. I mean, in terms of the whole uh, storage and, and 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 management of data on the cloud is another aspect. Uh, you have you know also you know location detection technologies from GPS to IoT, uh, so on and so forth, right? And then and then uh, all the way up to artificial intelligence, where uh, you know. Um, these are backend algorithms that basically uh, take, you know, a whole bunch of data and, 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 and detect patterns, right? And these are nonlinear patterns that uh, are, were, were virtually impossible without the kind of computing power that you uh, can now put towards it, right? So a lot of unstructured, previously unrelated, messy, uh, totally kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, organic data can now be, organized and and, 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 and and insights can be created from it. Intelligence can be created from it. Decision making can be uh, developed from it. So, so, so that's the power of technology. So we have, you know, we have, uh, you know, we have, we, we have this kind of totally unserved segment and we have technology that today that can potentially serve it, right? So in that sense, it is a perfect storm. Um, so let's just move ahead. Can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah. Uh, sorry. So, so, uh, so we have, uh, you know, now, now, what to, what, what to? Uh, I just wanted to spend some time on what I see as the financial life of, of an artisan, and also abstracting out a little bit in terms of the financial aspects of it. Um, you know, one, you have, uh, you have very volatile cash flows, right? So. Volatility, volatility in income, right? Because a lot of this is job-based work. Uh, um, volatility in terms of expenses, right? I mean, the market shocks and conditions and raw material kind of setbacks. Uh, and therefore, volatility ultimately with respect to their consumption, right? At the household level. Um, they also are exposed to severe shocks, right? So, uh, and risks. So those risks can be health-related, market-related, environmental, uh, so on and so forth. They, they, as I mentioned, there's limited access to institutional capital. So the reliance is greatly on local money lenders, chip funds, uh, you know, or friends and family or other such informal uh, mechanisms. Uh, there are weak financial capabilities in terms of understanding finance, uh, you know, being able to budget, save, uh, you know, act, achieve long-term goals, so on and so forth, right? Um, and their tenures are also, you know, relatively... Uh, uh, short. In fact, I mean, depending on certain types of crafts, sometimes some of these crafts like say stonework in, 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 in Rajasthan are actually occupational hazards, right? So they, they actually reduce life, uh, they, they reduce, uh, you know, life expectancy. Uh, I mean, stone cutters in Rajasthan, I mean, their typical life expectancy is, is south of 50 years. So, um, you know, again, from a pension standpoint, that is very important. Um, anyway, moving forward. We go to the next slide. Yeah, so, so uh, you know, I mean, traditional finance, the way when you go to a bank or when you go to even a microfinance institution today, right, um, without, you know, in, in the traditional mode of delivery does not really work for, for you know, micro business cash flows, right? Uh, and there are a bunch of reasons for this. So one is that, 
you know, just the way these suppliers work is that they focus on large ticket size, uh, long tenured products, right? Which who's very, by, by design, these products hamper affordability and uh, a kind of risk profile that is associated with informal communities, right? And therefore is not viable. So, uh, I mean, you can't, for instance, I mean, you cannot think of, if you think in terms of credit, I mean, you would not be, nobody, no bank is going to lend uh, an artisan a 2000 rupee loan, right? Uh, say for a month or two months. It just does not make sense. Uh, the economics would never work. Right. And if it would, I mean, given the paperwork and the way they underwrite, et cetera, it would, it would cost, it would be enormous and prohibitive for the, for the artisan. Uh, similarly, I mean, when it comes to payments, right, whether it's a savings plan or a systematic investment plan or even a credit repayment, right, these are typically uh, rigid in the form of fixed payment cycles, right? So it has nothing to do with the fact that, you know, it is not compatible with the fact that cash flows are volatile. So somebody has more money one month, but not in our, you know, their seasonality in their business. It, I mean, the, the, the product or the, or the solution provider does not take that into account. So, so you are basically, again, you know, trying to ram a, uh, you know, a, a, a square peg in a, in a round hole. And, and that is, uh, you know, that, that, that becomes a problem. Third, uh, you know, you, you, you will see a siloed view of financial needs. So, you know, Credit providers, you know, either you're thinking credit or you're thinking savings or you're thinking insurance or you're thinking pension or investments, but, but every product is, uh, you know, even if it belongs to the same organization, lots of times it's a, it is a different organization, but even within the same organization, it'll be a different team that has no kind of 360 view of the, of the consumer, right? Whereas again, for, you know, like an artisan or other informal um, individual, informal uh, small businesses or entrepreneurs, uh, you know, the cognitive overhead is, 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 is huge and they want simplicity, right? And for them, it's as simple as money coming in, money going out, and they just want to manage their money as, as best as they can, right? So there is, again, you know, digital enables those synergies, those, those, those uh, ways to combine and bundle different products and make sure that even you can exploit uh, the synergies between different products, which, which, which traditional finance does not allow. And lastly, um, given again the data, the real the real time data uh, that I was talking about, for instance, even coming through, say something like a like a like a mobile phone, right? Um, the, you know, you can you can monitor you can monitor the borrower, say on a on a regular basis, and detect kind of changes in the borrower patterns or life, uh, uh, you know, life events that happen, so on and so forth, and you can. You know, you can actually, um, you know, kind of course correct and 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 create products that are more dynamic in nature, that 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 are changed, tweaked. Uh, more flexibility can be provided, right, under certain circumstances, so on and so forth. So, so, so this is just to give you a sense of how traditional product, uh, traditional finance has, you know, would fail or has failed these communities, and why there is need along these same lines to create new digital paradigms that are much more optimized, relevant, and therefore valuable for these, these uh, segments. Uh, next, please. Can we have the next slide, please? Ah, uh, no, the next slide, sorry, you went back. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, so, so, um, so they are, so now when I, so the flip side of what can one do, how can digital help, right? I mean, uh, there are, you know, uh, it, even with Karma Life, what we have built, right, is a full stack solution, right? And it has four components. But I think, I mean, you know, that is the, you know, the this can be abstracted out for any kind of solution for, uh, you know, similar kind of uh, target segments. One is around the product and technology, right? And what I was saying is that, you know, it's the alternative data, not the formal regulated data that these communities do not have, unfortunately, but alternative data that say comes from the, you know, comes from the mobile phone or comes from even work histories with platforms, right? Platforms like Impulse, there are a whole set of other new, uh, you know, digital craft aggregator platforms that have come up, right? But, but, but that data can be used to understand the artisan uh, at, the, at the individual level, at the transaction level, underwrite them. Uh, predict their behavior, influence their behavior, right? Because even behavior is not 
uh, you know, it's not exogenous. It is something that is very much endogenous and can be uh, influenced. Um, the second, uh, you know, there is a whole host of digital infrastructure that exists, right? So from being able to authenticate using, uh, you know, digital KYCs to using, using UPI platforms um, uh, to account aggregators, which is a new, you know, data sharing infrastructure. Uh, so for instance, you know, we at Karma Life use e EKYCs and digitally in three minutes, we are able to onboard a new uh, borrower and enable credit, right? Literally in three minutes. Um, and that is, that was unprecedented. It was not, you know, something that was a bit, uh, that was, that was, uh, that one could do, um, you know, even a couple of years back. Um, so, so, so those are, and then of course, the simplification of the UI, right? To make it really simple for less literate segments. And I know that one, one aspect here is, you know, particularly for, for, for artisans and, and women in particular are, are even uh, smartphones, right? I mean, and that I think is something that, I mean, I, I don't see, honestly, I don't see any other way uh, to, um, you know, kind of get around this. Uh, I mean, there are, there are some ways in the distribution uh, aspect that I will talk about, but, but ultimately, you know, the, the, the only way to cost effectively uh, bring finance to uh, these communities is through the digital and through the smartphone, right? So we will have to kind of figure out ways, policy mechanisms, as well as, uh, you know, innovative financing mechanisms to enable them to become smartphone uh, uh, enabled. So, so uh, yeah, so, but, but, but once you have a phone, I mean, there is voice, visual, vernacular aspects that one can use to simplify the, the experience. The second part is the business model, right? So a lot of, like even you take uh, a financial service like credit, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's typically in traditional models, um, you know, it, it, it has, there are a slew of, of, of small fees and charges that just, uh, you know, confuse the user and convolute the relationship between the user and the solution provider. So, you know, almost making it simple for them where you bundle, you have bundle con con uh, combinations of products. Right. So, and you start thinking in terms of outcomes, not just products, but say goal-based savings, right. That enable you to save for a whole range of different types of goals. There, there are companies like Kaleidofin, et cetera, that started doing that. Right. Uh, in terms of say, you want to, you want something around health, you know, health resilience or health safety. And then that could include a bundle that, in, that has say, you know, health insurance, hospi cash, which is something I'll talk about when I talk a little bit about insurance later as well as say telemedicine, right? And be, being able to get a telemedicine checkup, right? As a, as a, as a quick consultation to, to, to understand, uh, you know, to get a doctor's uh, advice. Um, you know, so, 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 so those are kind of potential bundles and then, you know, very flat, simple kind of pricing structure. So even with Karma Life, for instance, one of the things we've done is we don't, you know, we just have a simple 99 rupees a month as the base, base model uh, fee. And, you know, we, we're working with gig, urban gig workers today, but, but it just, the traction for that is, is very high because, you know, it, it's very easy for them to pay. It's, it's, it's small enough, uh, affordable enough and, and easy enough. And they like the simplicity and the transparency of it because they know that they don't have to pay anything else. There are no questions asked and that's it. There are also ways to monetize through, you know, uh, through, through backend mechanisms, right? So if you're, uh, if you're, if you're, if you're tailoring insurance then you have an insurance manufacturer or an insurance provider on the back end. And, and, and insurance commissions, you know, there is a whole commission structure. So, so that, you know, there are other avenues that one has to also seek so that, uh, you know, the, uh, the onus on the, on the user is, is low and it's affordable. On the distribution side of it, I think, uh, you know, I mean, that the distribution with this segment is going to be one very important issue. And uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, you have to think about it in terms of how do you acquire customers, right? How do you ensure that, the usage of finance is sustainable, uh, that they are, you know, whatever learning or handholding is required around use of finance is, is, is able to be done. And how do you manage risk on an ongoing basis? Because underlying finance is always risk. Uh, so, so a couple of thoughts there. One is that, uh, you know, so, so working with aggregators and market linkage partners, right? People, entities that are either sourcing and selling onward selling for these, uh, you know, small businesses uh, or distributing raw, raw materials to them. I mean, those are, those are natural kind of partners uh, because they also have work history and they have a bunch of data on them, right? So that also helps from an underwriting and understanding perspective, right? So that you know that, you know, you have comfort as a, as a, as a lender 
uh, for example, that you know th this is this is a artisan who has been producing for say six months and you know has had steady incomes and therefore uh, is is you know credit worthy in that sense. Uh, the, the second part of distribution is to really look at the role of the local entrepreneur. Right. So typically, I mean, these are cluster models, right? Where you have a cluster and you have uh, a cluster champion or a master artisan or a you know kind of uh, you know, local entrepreneur, um, and that that individual or you know uh, needs to be uh, both a change agent as well as as well as a digital point of contact. So going back to the whole smartphone issue, if initially say people you know most of the community does not have smartphones, it might make a lot of economic sense uh, if the the local entrepreneur does not already to give them a smartphone, and then they become the conduit, right? I mean, and there are way to there are ways on the back end to even make the workflow between the master artisan and the individual sub artisan work if the individual sub -art artisan has a, a feature phone, right? Because at the end of the day, I mean, you know, you also don't want to create a little fiefdom where the local entrepreneur gets so much power and, 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 and is, is, you know, controlling finances and then they might abuse it. So, so that loop of accountability is important and technologically it can happen even through a smartphone to feature phone based SMS led or IVRS led uh, solution, right? So there are ways to do that, but uh, you, need, you need at least your local entrepreneur to have uh, a smartphone so that they can, they can at least, you know, kind of, you know, some of the, some of the core uh, digital workflows can be done seamlessly. Uh, and then lastly, uh, you know, there are obviously service integrations at the back so that you can actually provide this one-stop shop uh, for all financial needs of, of the users. Um, okay, so we can move move ahead. I'll, I think I just have a couple of slides more, which I'll go through very quickly. Namrata, can we can we move on? Okay, um, thanks. So uh, so 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 here we are. You know, so so again, this is um, um, this is a you know from Karma Life. So we start with that whole risk score right at the bottom, and that risk score is real time digital risk, right? So it actually uh, you know, in our case, I mean, we're talking about urban gig workers. Gig work, by by definition, is is are people who move from job to job, right? And and their tenures are very short. So the mobile, uh, you know, data is is critical, right? And that creates your karma score and assesses that helps us assess risk. Now, on top of that, we we trace then a hierarchy of needs. So you have credit. Credit will help you, you know, smoothen your consumption because you get kind of monthly uh, digital line of credits. You can also get term loans to, to finance growth. Then you have insurance. Insurance you know, mitigates your risk. It limits your downside. And it actually helps. Even it helps you use credit sustainably because you, you know, you're, you're not, if you have a shock, uh, say, a, a, you know, a shock, a health shock, then your insurance kicks in and helps and supports that. Right? And so you don't have to kind of get into a debt trap or a debt spiral. Um, then you have savings and investments, which is all around accumulating wealth attaining your long-term goals, short-term or long-term goals, right? Enhancing, again, it enhances credit because it provides some collateral to, to, to boost your credit worthiness and your, your ability to access credit. And then lastly, you have pension, right? And pension people don't talk about, but if you think about the Indian uh, context, I mean, pension is actually extremely important because, you know, right now we're, we're in a demographic, uh, you know, bulge when it comes to our country. But by 2050, we are talking about a scenario where, uh, you know, the, 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 the old retired uh, folks will, will become, you know, kind of as big as the, as large as the, as the, as the, as the, as the working uh, uh, segment. So, you know, very soon we're going to, you know, have to think about uh, pension and it will become an issue. And if you look at, you know, just some of the economics around pension today, it is actually, you know, very scary uh, in terms of, you know, what, what sort of future we are tracking towards. So, uh, particularly for, 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 I know there are all sorts of cognitive biases that come in when it comes to informal people accessing finance and thinking of insurance and pension in particular, but, um, but, but these, are, these, are, these are hugely important products that, that need to be understood and marketed uh, accordingly. Um, so moving forward. Yeah, I think we can move on. So this is this is just you know, uh, let's just let's go forward.
Yeah, so I just wanted to introduce, I mean, Emma told me to talk a little bit about insurance and I thought I'll also talk about pension. So there are, you know, there's a lot of product innovation, right, that has happened uh, in the back end in these industries. These are very, these have been traditional stodgy industries and now with digital channels and, and, and you know, it, there's been a new kind of wave of democratization of finance and, and, and that has also led to uh, more innovation. So, for example, you know, particularly for the artisanal segment and similar segments, uh, you know, there is... You take, say, traditional health insurance, where you, you know, get, um, you know, you you get covered for expenses for hospitalization. You see very, very little traction for that kind of product amongst these informal segments because uh, a they they you know they're not. I mean, even when they have a health shock, they don't have you know they don't go to expensive hospitals. Their out-of-pocket expenses are relatively low because they go to um, you know kind of public uh, health facilities and so on and so forth. Second, there is a lot of mistrust around the whole claims process. They see it as cumbersome and, and, and long, and you know, you know, they have, they have they've heard horror stories about it. So, you know, as a result, health health insurance is very difficult to market. If you take something like hospital cash, uh, what hospital cash does is it basically gives you no no questions asked um, a certain payment per day for every day that is spent in a hospital against a requisition form that a hospital gives you that you can simply. Uh, you know, kind of uh, take a snap of and send. Right now, what that does is it enables, uh, A, the claims process is easy. Second, it enables, it actually what it helps is it helps indemnify you against foregone income. Right? So any income loss that you have due to a health shock, which is the most important, uh, you know, kind of um, risk to a lot of these folks um, is what that covers, right? So if I, I'm an artisan and I fell sick and I was unable to do jobs, say for like a week, uh, you know, I could be on a hospital cash plan that gives me, you know, as long as I'm hospitalized, right, and I can show evidence of that, I can get say 500 rupees a day for those seven weeks, but uh, you know, against a, a plan that covers me for say 30 days or 15 or 30 days a, a year, right, at a very reasonable cost. We're talking about like, maybe 5, you know, 500 to 1,000, maybe 1,000 rupees a, a year. Um, Right. So, so, so that's an example of a product that, you know, is, 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 is an innovation, but it, it, it just makes a lot more sense for this, uh, for this particular community. Um, similarly, micro pensions. So if you look at the three types of pensions, right, there is the pension that state that the state is mandated to provide. Now state pension is very inadequate, right? If you look at overall numbers, uh, only 8% of, of, of the eligible population is actually covered. And even for them, uh, you know, they are, they are, their pension coverage is only 10% of, you know, their income, right? And then you have employer employer pension. And none of these informal, I mean, 90% informal, right, in India. And so 90% are not covered by insurance pension. So, so you have this concept now of micro pension, which is... A voluntary pension that can be tweaked however you want and uh, it, it allows you to, to, uh, to, to you know, contribute to my contribution on a monthly basis on a on a on a on a you know weekly basis on on a you know once in three months whatever you are you just have a lot more flexibility when it comes to that and also you know unlike locking your amount your money in a in an account which you don't have access to uh, till you till you retire, you actually can, can access that liquidity, uh, right? So, so, so that, those are some of the product innovations. So I just leave it at that. I know we are grossly out of uh, time. Um, happy to answer any questions if I... If um, if thank is. you, thank you, thank you, Babola. There are lots and lots of comments in the chat box and questions regarding warranties, whether it's best to have a warranty, which is more effective online or from face-to-face -face sales and questions around how you sustain uh, the financial cash flow model around seasonality uh, within, the within the craft sector. So if you could take a look in the chat box and, yeah. and perhaps address them directly there, that would, that would be terrific. And, uh, and again, okay. very uh, much. Maybe I'll, uh, in the interest of time, why don't I just like take what you just mentioned and I'll, I'll maybe we can come back if, if need be so so right. i'd say that uh, so i'd say that face to face yeah yeah so i mean you know i mean finance finance is always something that is you know trust based right so trust is extremely important uh, but there are different ways to create trust yeah i think trust is also about 
you know, repeat transactions. So if you've had a history of repeat transactions, so again, if you come back to that concept of small ticket, short tenure, right? And if they're, you know, if, if you're turning like, let's say instead of credit, I'm not doing a six month credit, I'm just giving you a bi-weekly credit. Every two weeks you get like a 2000 rupee uh, line of credit that you can spend. Now, every two weeks you have, uh, you know, sort of a, uh, uh, you know, you have, you have an experience of whether this worked for you or not, right? And, and if it's the right product and it's optimized, then you have a positive experience and that creates trust, right? So there are different ways to create trust. I mean, typically for bringing people on, that's what I was talking about, the platform as well as the local entrepreneur. Uh, there are ways to, 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 you know, create or make them change agents, right? And, and, and align incentives in a way that, that they become a champion, right? And you have to think through that incentive design and the way you, you deploy your systems. But, but that works really well because I think, you know, at the end of the day, there is no way, there is just no way. And I, you know, I know we've tried, we have this business correspondent model, we have all sorts of things, but from a profitability and scale, scaling standpoint, there's no way to do this unless it is, you know, uh, entirely digital, right? I mean, the cost will never work, right? The cost economics will never work. So that's where I'm a big believer in terms of like, you know, you have to pick people up, uh, you know, by the bootstrap and really kind of, you know, create like, you know, address the digital divide, right? Um, and I know it's hard, you know, I mean, it's not overnight, uh, but, but that is, the, that needs to be the vision. And that means to, you know, I mean, all stakeholders have to work towards that to kind of make this truly happen. Great. Excellent. Yeah, in, terms of, in terms of seasonality, I think, again, digital gives you so much flexibility, right? So even when you have, like for us in Karma Life, we, because of that digital, you know, data that we look at, right, we are able to separate or we try and separate intent from circumstance. So if somebody cannot pay a loan because, say, they were, you know, an urban uh, migrant worker, and they had to return to their 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 uh, you know village for a for a due to a shock, right? We can actually ascertain that and give them you know a more flexible kind of plan as opposed to you know have a one size fits all. And say you didn't make your your EMI and therefore you're going to be penalized. So I think that kind of flexibility around seasonality, around shocks, around you know kind of these uh, very unique location or movement patterns is something that digital enables for. That's the whole. Uh, you know, the power of it. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Digital power and connectivity is clearly key in terms of how you reach your market. Uh, as a key, and on that basis, we'll move to our next big player of the afternoon to kind of round us off uh, with our final speaker and uh, the big hitter, perhaps, of the afternoon amongst the whole series of big hitters. Um, we have Rajat Arora, who's the policy and program manager for Facebook India. And Rajat is going to be speaking about the role of technology and mentorship in improving lives of young people amongst different communities. Rajat, over to you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. I uh, hope I and everyone can see me. Just a thumbs up from your side will do. Perfect. Perfect. Awesome. So uh, thanks for the introduction. Thanks, Emery. Thanks, Hasina. Thanks, Jonathan, for giving me this opportunity. I'll try to stick with the eight minute golden rule uh, because people on Internet have goldfish span of attention. So I'll stick to the basics over here and I'll, I'll try to be directly uh, absolutely on the point and more than happy to respond to any queries post that. Uh, uh, Emery, can you please uh, project my slides? Perfect. So today I'll be talking about this recently launched initiative by Facebook and Ministry of Tribal Affairs. The program's name is Goal. Uh, full form is Going Online as Leaders. Uh, next slide, please. So basically the structure of this entire discussion or my presentation is revolving around uh, three components. And uh, I, I'll, I'll not just be sharing the insights for, for what we guys are doing uh, around Facebook, specifically supporting the, the marginalized or tribal communities in India, but rather from holistic perspective, why we are getting into these things. And then there are certain call to actions or support that we would be anticipating from you all uh, in order to make sure that uh, we not just as small communities, but as a state, as a country are moving in the right direction. Uh, over to the next slide. So, 
So just setting the context over here, uh, you might be wondering why Facebook is getting into all these uh, uh, narrative of, of, of supporting communities and how we are talking about social and economic development of the community. So everything is rooted into our Facebook's mission, which is to give people the power to build community and bring the world closer together. So basically what it typically means for us when we get into any conversation is how do we help people build supportive communities that strengthen traditional institutions, especially in times of COVID, like these, these struggles sometimes, when technology is playing a very important role in connecting people to support ecosystems. Uh, second thing is, how do we help people build a safer community that prevents them from harm, helps them during crisis, and rebuilds afterwards in a world where everyone across the world uh, are, are directly or in, indirectly affected by uh, the challenges. Over to the next slide, please. So I'll set the context over here. What is this program goal? Uh, uh, next slide, please. So basically what we realized was that it's not just uh, a training or upskilling people that makes a lot of deeper impact but also raising the level of aspiration plays an important role in this entire uh, conversation. So how we are doing all these things and over last three years uh, under Facebook economic impact program, what we have learned is number one, we thought that upskilling can solve a major challenge, but it's not just upskilling. It's also about raising the level of aspiration. Uh, then when we started working on the aspiration level, like, like, uh, Karma was talking about how to build uh, stories. So one one point just to add to what Karma's suggestion was that people are not buying products or services. People are buying stories. Things or stories that they can relate to typically is what people are buying or consuming online. Uh, from the level of aspiration, the next big uh, uh, hitter for us is mentorship. So mentorship, typically what we have seen is, is, is only revolving around in startup circles, but, but can mentorship be taken at the grassroots level? And can we talk about something which can be done at scale, uh, not just confined to small clusters or ecosystem? And third, how technology can play a very important role in this, catalyzing this entire conversation. Next slide, please. So this is what Facebook is, is doing. This is the project. So this project was launched in 2019 Feb. Uh, this was launched last year. That was phase number one in partnership with Niti IO. At Facebook, we are committed to helping bridge the gender gap uh, and going online as leaders was, is our flagship program designed to provide mentorship leadership training, digital literacy skills to youth. And in phase one, it was typically focused on girls from these five states that you are seeing on your screen, which was West Bengal, Jharkhand, Odisha, Maharashtra and Madhya Pradesh. So what we did in this entire phase one was we identified 100 girls uh, uh, as mentees and we connected them to 25 industry leaders uh, who were acting as their mentors. The ratio of mentor to mentee was one is to four. Uh, during this entire conversation, uh, this, this entire program was for nine months uh, uh, last year, the phase one. And out of these nine months, 25 women leaders coached and mentored these 100 girls on business skills, entrepreneurship skills, ideas, or maybe life skills also. Uh, the additional training was typically focused on digital literacy, problem solving, entrepreneurship, as well as leadership in this entire conversation. Uh, the key objectives of phase one and, and key or key objectives of this entire goal program was to increase the number of tribal women owned businesses on the ground. Uh, second, create role models through them within their communities that that can inspire thousands of other women or youth in their local communities. So some, there are some interesting stories that I can quickly share with you. So imagine a girl whose family income is uh, less than 7,000 rupees a month, cannot afford a smartphone or internet connection. Uh, accessibility, affordability itself is a major challenge coming from tribal background so, and, and above the age of 18. So these are the kind of 100 girls or mentees that were shortlisted. We supported them with smartphones and mentorship. And suddenly we saw some massive impact on the ground. So 82% of the mentees are now using technology to highlight 
issues in their villages so example the local sarpanch they they reach out to some of these girls in the local communities and they have been now designated as digital sarpanch so what is a sarpanch on the ground anyone who can identify the issues uh, bring communities closer together uh, take their issues or solutions um, uh, to the government so these are the kind of ways in which our our mentees from phase 1 are now supporting the the district uh, uh, collectors or maybe the government administration at hyper local level uh, 63% of mentees have now enhanced their understanding of local communities so imagine in times of covid some of the most interesting or or, or uh, uh, support support that these communities need at the bottom of pyramid is where do i get food uh, what are those government kind of incentives that are available for me uh, what are those healthcare facilities that are available next to me how do i leverage that entire ecosystem so technology is being used and they are now socializing that idea amongst their local communities and i'm talking about a real absolutely at the bottom of pyramid kind of uh, uh, segment and now 100% this is like one of the best things that 100% of mentees from phase 1 are now able to address crowd confidently so one of the mentors in phase 1 was uh, miss archana kochar she is a fashion designer from mumbai uh, she supported three girls from gachiroli district which is like again a tribal district in maharashtra Uh, she supported them with their designs how to make bags how to make masks and and early this year their designs were showcased in london fashion week so imagine like these girls literally uh, their talent uh, was was showcased at a global level uh, last most important thing or or one of the most beautiful things that that happened through this entire conversation was that when we look at the tribal communities it that there is a perception that they cannot afford things there is no talent they always need support but but when we started working with them the it was absolutely flip side uh, our conversation we started having with them so now there are a lot of things there is some brilliant talent that we are able to see in tribal communities specifically uh, which we want to showcase not just in india but at global level plus there are a lot of learnings in times of covid like people are now getting into organic now reliance is more upon improving immunity on the ground so can these learnings be taken from tribal communities and can people like us sitting in cities adopt these learning so so it's not just at at city level or state level or not even at country level but rather how do we take these interesting learnings in these difficult times across the world so that's one of the principal objectives with which we have taken this partnership uh, from phase 1 which was limited to just 100 mentees to next level uh, where we have now partnered with ministry of uh, tribal affairs next slide please so now we partnered with ministry of tribal affairs we showcased our learnings to the government and said that okay this is what is happening this is the incredible story that is brewing at the bottom of pyramid in india how do we take that entire conversation on to next level and we were fortunate enough uh, with all the progressive support and and uh guidance that we got from the government and especially some senior uh, officials at ministry of tribal affairs now we we launched our partnership this partnership was launched last year in october it took almost 6 months to institutionalize this partnership it's not just a launch announcement but but rather there are some heavy duty things that we are doing in this in this partnership next slide please so how do we define success what will happen in phase 2 so definition of success that we mutually agreed with uh, uh ministry of tribal affairs is very very simple uh it's not just what is happening at a strategic level but at the hyper local at the bottom of pyramid level this is what people should definitely feel realize the impact on the ground so number one is because of this kind of initiative where technology is empowering communities at the grassroots level are there any livelihood opportunities that are being created for mentees because of phase 1 we have firm belief that yes yes is the answer over here second because of uh, the technology uh, uh, new entrepreneurs are getting created so will new enterprises be created on the ground will they also create or empower more women uh, because of which more jobs will be created at hyper local level and third most important things these are some ripple effects that we might see in the future and we are very bullish on this uh, 
number one is like because of all the reverse migration that is happening right now there will be a lot of pressure on local economies and entrepreneur and, and all the job losses that are about to happen because economy is definitely not in good shape so how do we or the projects like these can create some sort of mass entrepreneurs on the ground or can these small artisans or these these entrepreneurs become the job creators in local ecosystem uh, third biggest success will be like if they are able to or if youth at the grassroots level is able to learn or absorb more things from the ecosystem so uh, if i am at a district or maybe at a village level so maybe i might confine to just one or two people telling me what's happening in the ecosystem but can technology help me understand better uh, or learn new things get more opportunities for my local ecosystem absolutely that there's the answer uh, fourth is how do we create an enabling environment it's not just about economic development but it's also about the social development uh there is some amazing rich art and craft and culture coming on coming out from tribal communities again can we can we take this entire conversation on to next level so that's simple pure vanilla definition definition of success that we have in this project next slide please so uh, if i talk about the ecosystem particularly for for this immediate uh, uh, program what we are doing is we are identifying 5000 mentees uh, again these mentees will be crowdsourced at national level so example if you are planning to apply for this program you can go to the portal i'll just share the link of the portal as well just apply over there you have to submit all your details it's a government portal all the data will be absolutely uh, safe and and government is managing this entire portal uh, second thing that is happening in this conversation is uh, it's not just for mentees but it's also for, also for mentors uh, there are four sectors that we saw that majority of the traction in tribal areas are revolving around four sectors and sub sectors which are agriculture and light activities art and culture handicraft textile and health and education so these are like four focus uh, sectors for us and how that entire ecosystem is shaping up with support of digital curriculum technology you don't have to step out from your uh, comfort of your home to get into a program like this and this is the new normal now uh, because of all the lockdown social distancing uh, how can you still leverage the best the world has to offer and with the help of technology this is what will happen in this program uh, next please so basically uh, this is like a 9 month engagement 9 month program where first 7 months you will get support from your mentors you will learn about digital skills life skills leadership skills and sector specific skills uh, for first 7 months after this learning uh there will be two months of internship that will be either in a big major corporate or maybe uh, at a government institution so it's not a free program you literally have to earn it you have to literally showcase that yes there is strong potential and 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 this is where uh, uh there is there are some strong synergies between us and ministry of tribal affairs so just getting on the crux what will a mentee get in this project you will get a certificate from ministry of tribal affairs and 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 motai's ministry of tribal affairs and facebook certifying that you have graduated from this program letter of recognition from your mentor and mentor i can give a small example in phase 1 we were supposed to identify 25 mentors but uh when we invited applications more than 1800 industry leaders uh, came forward to extend their helping hand uh, in this conversation so in this case we will have one mentor to two mentees the ratio is 1 is to 2 and the idea is absolutely deeper impact on the ground and that's the reason why we are not going way too aggressive on some massive numbers over here more focus is on impact in this entire conversation second uh, you will get opportunity to intern at a leading private organization or government organization plus people who will be shortlisted in this program will get smartphone and internet access for one year again provided by uh, facebook plus you will get opportunity to interact with some industry leaders not just from india but from across the world so suddenly if because of technology without you moving out of your house if you are able to learn from the best in the world then definitely a lot of more opportunities are created not just for an individual but for the communities at large uh, next slide please 
next slide please this is the last part so the portal has already been created the portal's name is goal.tribal.gov.in uh, it's a public portal. You should definitely go on this portal. There are a lot of resources that are available on this portal. The application is open for two months. So starting from May 15 to June 14, the applications are open or we are accepting or Facebook and, and Ministry of Tribal Affairs are accepting applications for both mentors as well as mentees. So next slide, please. So key functionalities that we have uh, added into this portal in partnership with Ministry of Tribal Affairs is they are detailed FAQs, frequently asked questions, online registration form, query gathering, resolution mechanism is there and tracking project progress. So each and every week, whatever conversations you are having with your mentors, everything, the entire monitoring and evaluation will be done. Again, the focus is impact, not just hitting numbers or getting applications in this portal. Next, next please. Uh, you can apply as a mentor. There are some basic guidelines. Um, and, and again, this, this is typically meant for uh, the youth in tribal communities across India. So you would have to submit your certificates and all other details. We are getting some substantial um, uh, response from uh, uh, not just leaders from, from or senior policymakers, but also there are some people from Bollywood who are willing to support this initiative. So you will see a lot of uh, uh, support coming in, so a lot of campaigns coming out for this goal program. Next, please. Next, please. Thank you. So this is pure vanilla, simple project. Look forward to your support to become either mentees. And again, a lot of industry leaders are watching this uh, uh, session being organized by uh, uh, Impulse and, and British Council. So I, it's, it's, it's a request from Facebook family that please come forward. This is the golden chance to support communities. All that you have learned, it can definitely change and improve life of not just one individual, but like a lot of lives attached to that individual. Thank you very much and please stay safe, everyone. Huge thanks, Rajat. And just a reminder for those who are watching online in terms of the link, it's goal.tribal.gov.in, the call to action. Um, I'm just going to quickly summarize before in heading, um, heading back to Emmerine for final vote of thanks to all of our speakers today. Just, it's been so clear that in, in spite of the, the constraints and the pressures of COVID-19, there are so many opportunities that also come as a result of it. Um, and certainly in terms of what has been so clear from all of our speakers in terms of their generous and insightful sharing this afternoon. is empowerment comes from the ground up. Skills development are absolutely about that long-term sustainability and the most critical now care of the lockdown situation and what that might mean across the, the craft sector long-term. If we look at say clusters, technology, incubators, mentorships, showcasing at fashion weeks, design interventions, the, the value and virtue of organic products and the local hyper-local um, pr productivity and production, the virtue and absolute critical use of data and analysis, infrastructure and pensions and insurance needed, um, and sales and profile are all part of how we tell the story of crafts and the story of the crafts individual, their community, their product, their heritage and their skill. So it's the big, I guess, takeaway for me is it's all around storytelling through the work that is created. Um, and with that, I'll thank all of our speakers who've been really astonishing and thanks for everyone's patience online today whilst we had some Great cheese on the Wi-Fi connectivity across the course of the afternoon. Thanks to our partners who've been so supportive of, of the planning for the session today. I'll hand back now to Impulse, NGO and Emmerine with a final thought that is also a British Council campaign at the moment, which is hashtag culture connects us. I think if anything today has said that across all of our speakers, audiences online and the panelists, uh, sharing of knowledge, Culture connects us. With that, back to you, Emery.
Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thank you to all our speakers, uh, Karma, Badal, and Rajat. Uh, I think they've really woven the stories together on how we can actually accelerate digital technological platform. Uh, and also for me, the biggest takeaway would be about the power of storytelling. How do we seize the opportunity in the world of technology uh, and seize the, the market and people's heart? So that's one of my biggest takeaway. Thank you so much uh, for this webinar. Thank you everyone for coming in and bearing with us for three hours straight. Thank you so much. And I hope this was a very resourceful uh, webinar for you all. Uh, we do have a feedback or a survey form, a link given on the chat box if you all can uh, give in your responses or feedback to how this webinar was and what what can we do better to create a more proactive webinar in the future. Uh, this That would be great. And uh, yes, uh, thank you so much to British Council for uh, agreeing to partner with us, despite the fact that we were supposed to do this in Gohati in person, but it did not happen. But thank you so much for coming in. Thank you to Indian Institute of Entrepreneurship for always believing in, in us and always coming in whenever we needed the, the kind of support we wanted in the Northeast. And thank you to Facebook for helping us creating a much more larger audience through Facebook. Thank you so much. And also we will be looking forward to doing a lot more programs with Facebook and definitely we'll share out a lot of, uh, you know, uh, information about goal, which will really help build a lot of connect and uh, leaders in the Northeast of India. So thank you. With that, I will close this webinar. And, yeah, can, I, so can I just take half of Sure. Second, please. Yeah, Hemarin, can I just come in for half a second? Just a half a second. Just, uh, no, I would like to just thank Jonathan first uh, for really moderating it in an excellent fashion, um, uh, despite the glitches that we saw. And uh, uh, wonderfully done. And I think uh, we learned a lot, just like he summarized. Um, the, although I think uh, we there are many more questions which are left to be asked. And I think uh, we probably will do that. I don't know whether we can get uh, email links of all the panelists so that we can have a contact and you know we could start something with them. I just send uh, something to Rajat also. We are working with the Tribal Affairs Ministry also. And uh, you know we'd love to have a connect in terms of what they have been doing. Uh, but uh, thanks uh, British Council, thanks uh, Emerin and uh, Hasina Impulse uh, for making this happen. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, seminar that we had or a webinar that we had. And uh, we from I would look forward to having much more of them and uh, days forward. But uh, before I leave or I ask people to leave, uh, I would like to thank our team and uh, I with uh, under the leadership of Dr. Shiprana Borua, who's doing an immense work in this nearest thing. And I think we hope that through this, we will be able to pre bring about a new crop of entrepreneurs who would change the scene in the Northeast. And uh, we look forward for that. And we'd like to really collaborate with all of you uh, in uh, going forward. Thank you very much.